Waking up in the body of a standard Jinnin, a village invasion on the horizon, and a countdown to a full-out apocalypse only a few years away, what's a lad to do? There was only one thing he could do, cheat. Thankfully, this game system that instigated all of this in the first place was quite helpful. Gamer insert. What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto a Shinobi with Gamer System. Part 1. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. His chest ached, his lungs struggling with every moment to exhale just a little bit of breath and then take it back in. Tears blurred his eyes, making his vision blurry. Granted, not that he would be able to see much of anything even if they weren't washing over his iris. The thick black smoke cloying at his throat and swirling throughout the building in amongst red-hot flames. Freakin, Terroristsmann. It was sad, pathetic, really. All he could do was sit here and moan and groan dazed and waiting to die. He'd love to escape if he could, but considering the large, weighty pillar pinning him beneath it, well, that wasn't likely and he was seriously up Crap Creek without a paddle. Honestly, it was odd how calm he felt about all of this. But then, it wasn't like anybody would even miss him. He was just a no-name orphan, no family, no friends, nobody that cared about it all, not even the orphanage matron. Ah, this freaking sucks. He groaned internally. The only joy he had in life was working out an anime, not really a pair of hobbies that went together. But hey, one inspired the other. He had nothing really going for him, but anime had inspired him, made him realize that he didn't need to if he put the work in. Too bad that wasn't going to amount to anything, since some dramatic asshole had come to school this morning and decided to blow themselves up for whatever reason. Probably being bullied, his life was that sad that he would get killed over a cliché like that. God damn it, he didn't want to die. As pathetic as a reason it was, he hadn't finished watching his favorite anime. Surely life couldn't be so cruel as to do him in before that? He never got to see if Luffy became Pirate King, or if Natsu found his dad, if Ash became a champion finally, or the conclusion of the fight between Naruto and Sasuke. A flame boiled in his chest, not unlike the roaring embers, threatening to swallow him whole and burn him alive. He'd never had anything going for him his entire life and it, it wasn't fair. Do you wish to live? I've gone mad. He gaped as his vision suddenly cleared in an instant and found himself staring at a floating ebony black screen with crimson red writing. For a moment he just stared, forgetting where he was. Took him a moment to shake off the shock. Was he seeing things, hallucinating now that the smoke was getting to him? Was he about to lose consciousness? He struggled, trying to lift his arms, to no avail. The weight of the pillar pinning him to the ground was just too much. Seriously, to hell with this school. A derisive snort left his lips. Of course I want to live! He spat, losing himself in the delusion for a moment. His life was crap, but it was his crap life. Just as he spoke, the crimson red words on the black screen shimmered and a different sentence appeared. Very well. Prepare for transmigration. He blinked. What? He uttered. But that was all the time he had to say anything, because a split second later, the screen seemed to balloon in size and warp around him like an all-consuming cocoon of red and black, and then butterflies fluttered in his stomach as he felt himself falling. He didn't even have time to be shocked at being swallowed by the thing or the trippy red and black darkness all around him, because a moment later, a lifetime of memories crashed into his mind, sweeping through and integrating deeply within his psyche. Daiki Yurii, or rather Yurii Daiki awoke with a gasp, pushing himself up onto all fours and panting deeply. He stared at the mud beneath him as his mind raced. What? He swallowed heavily, having trouble processing. He lifted one hand from underneath him and traced his throat with a finger, feeling nothing but unblemished skin. That wasn't right. 
He could vividly remember the feeling of a kanai slicing through his jugular and his vision going dark moments later as he bled out and died. Freakin' IWA Ninja. They caught sight of him during a delivery mission just across the border of Fire Country. A pair of seasoned chunin who thought it would make for a grand old time to bully and murder the young Kanoha Jenin. Pricks. But that wasn't right either. Yes, that assuredly did happen, he was decent enough with Genjutsu to tell if that was real or fake and it was definitely real. But rather, he remembered things. Things that made no sense. Of a boy just like him, an orphan, a nobody worth nothing, caught in an explosion during schooling and waiting, pinned beneath a heavy pillar waiting to either asphyxiate from the smoke or be burnt alive by the flames, whatever came first. And incredibly, beyond even having the memories of another teenager dying, was the fact that said teenager had memories of watching an anime called Naruto, all about the life of Uzumaki Naruto. He graduated with an orange wearing dope called Uzumaki Naruto. The same blonde moron that he saw in his memories of that anime. Just what the hell is going on? Daiki groaned, clutching at his throbbing head. What he knew of his own world, of his own village that he dedicated his loyalty to was horrifying. While he couldn't speak of what happened later in that anime, he could straight up say that it wasn't wrong at all about Naruto's younger years. How insane! The QB, Uzumaki Naruto, Achiha Sasuke, Jinchuriki, Orochimaru, Akatsuki, the Sage of Six Paths. The sheer daunting prospect of what awaited the world in the near future almost made his throat close up in horror. But how? This didn't make sense. For one, they seemed to be from completely different worlds, hell, completely different dimensions, there was no such thing as chakra in that world from his memories. How the hell would that world be able to not only see clearly into his own, but even know of the future of it? Wait! His eyes widened as he remembered something. That box? Was it not a delusion? His mind raced once more as he tried to make sense of it. It looked almost like a status S dash, just as he spoke. The air rippled with black light and before his very eyes. That familiar screen he saw at the end of that other boy's life appeared before him, crimson red text and all. Yet, compared to what it was like before, asking questions about wanting to live, it was now wholly different. Name, Daiki Yuriai, age 13, chakra capacity, 936-936, Jenin, strength, 14-500, endurance. 14 slash 500. Durability. 14 out of 500. Agility. 14 out of 500. Taijutsu. 25 slash 500. Ninjutsu. 20 slash 500. Genjutsu. 10 slash 500. Bukijutsu. 15 slash 500. Chakra control. 30 slash 500. Chakra affinities. Lightning. Not applicable you have no training with this element. It looked almost like it was listing his abilities as a shinobi. His general shinobi training and physical abilities were listed in a numerical value out of 500. And he even had a numerical value for his chakra, but right next to it, labeled as genin. So did that mean according to it, he had as much chakra as a typical genin? Sure, one could gauge the sheer volume of chakra others had, so technically it could be listed in a numerical value. But where did it get these numbers from? And chakra affinity? His affinity was lightning? Well, that totally saved him having to pull together his money to buy chakra conductive paper to test his affinity. Those things cost a pretty penny. Odd though, his father was from Kirigikur. He moved to Kanoha to escape the harsh living conditions of the Mist Village and met his mother, a Kanoha native. Not that he'd ever met them. They were apparently killed during the Kyuubi's attack on the village, leaving him orphaned. But still, it would make more sense for him to have a water or fire affinity, not lightning. How the hell was he going to learn lightning jutsu in the land of fire? He was totally going to have to pay people or crap to teach him, wasn't he? Wait. Wait, that's not important. Daiki huffed, glaring at the screen. Is this all you're doing? He demanded. The screen did not change at all. No other words appearing to answer his questions. He tried tossing out a few arbitrary commands, but nothing, it just stayed the same. The only thing that got any reaction was him telling it to go away, making it disappear. Daiki then collapsed on his backside and looked up at the sky above with a sigh. I suppose I can't really complain, he mused. 
Not only had he died, but that other boy, his other self, he had been about to die as well. This system, or whatever it was, it had saved them both, in a way. They were both dead, but together they lived on as one. And he definitely could not deny that the knowledge he had gained was useful. Even just two minor things that Naruto learned early on, tree walking and water walking, were completely alien to him before now. He was a member of the Genin Corps after all, a failure who graduated the academy, but failed to pass his given Jonin Sensei's exam. Daiki snorted, Genma, huh? He hummed. As it turned out, his possible sensei had been a bit of a big shot, being a personal guard to the Hokage, and being taught how to use the fabled Horatian by the Yandame before his passing. By sealing the QB into his son of all things, to think he used to blindly believe Minato Namikaze had killed the QB and worshipped the ground he walked on. So much lies, as expected of a shinobi village, he supposed. Sighing, Daiki decided it was best to get a move in. He couldn't hang around here for much longer. Who knew if those IWA jerks were still in the area? He could decide what to do with all his new information in his head when he returned to Kanoha. He pushed himself up from his sitting position and groaned. Of course, he rolled his eyes. He was standing in the middle of a ditch. Those assholes had literally tossed his body in a ditch after ganging up on him and murdering him. Well, at the very least he could still see the town he'd delivered the scroll to for his mission so he could find his way back. He checked the equipment pouch tied around his hip and sighed in relief when he found his equipment untouched. At least they hadn't looted his body. Thankfully, Daiki's mission didn't take him all that far from the land of fire borders that had patrols of Kanoha Shinobi, so he didn't need to worry about any enemy ninja for the most part. Rather, any that did manage to get past the border patrol would be way above his ability to deal with anyway. He arrived back in his home village by nightfall, exhausted and sweaty as all hell, but relieved. He wasn't afraid at all to face his death head-on. He'd already experienced it once, but he couldn't exactly say he wasn't tense and twitchy all the way back. A weight was completely removed from his shoulders when he passed through the large gates of Kanoha and into the safety of his home. He made a beeline for the mission desk and turned in his mission results straight away and happily took the 54,000 Rio he was awarded for his efforts. As sad as it was to be considered a career genin, part of the jokingly named dropout corps by many in the academy, the fact he didn't have a sensei or a team provided at least one boon, two even. He wasn't stuck constantly doing D-rank missions after completing ten of them, could choose to do missions whenever he pleased and not need his sensei to do them and he could take them himself and thus get to keep the reward all to himself. After pocketing the reward from his first ever C-rank mission, Daiki returned to his lonely one-bedroom apartment he'd been provided once he entered the Shinobi Academy. Once he was home, door locked securely behind him, Daiki collapsed on his ratty couch and groaned in relief, Never thought I'd be glad to see this crap hole, he snorted. He wasn't able to relax for long though, before his mind wandered back to the massive bunny bijou in the room, the future and his memories of it. As much as he'd love to believe it to be wrong, he was never that lucky. And he couldn't exactly just go telling someone about this. One wrong suspicion and he could find himself in torture and interrogation, getting tortured the crap out of and then mind raped by a Yamanaka. That didn't sound like a fun time at all. Really, the only thing he could do was prepare himself and make sure he lived. To be honest, he didn't exactly care all that much for Kanoha anyway. It wasn't like he was treated all that well here. Hell, he was treated as a failure because he was in the Genin Corps. Seriously, he couldn't stress enough how bullcrap it was that he was being treated as a failure because his would-be sensei gave them a stupidly difficult task to complete and they failed. He demanded they land a hit on him, a hit on a freaking seasoned jonin. Bullcrap. Daiki knew he wasn't exactly the shining highlight of Shinobi, he was middle of the pack in his class, the true top of the line had been Sasuke. But lazy craps like Nara Shikamaru who never put in any effort passed, and even Haruno Sakura whose physical abilities were abysmal past. He'd even claim it was bullcrap Naruto got a pass over him, but while better than Naruto on paper, he'd lost quite a few bouts to the blonde-haired boy during their time in the academy because the blonde just would not stay down and outlasted him through sheer tenacity. Daiki sighed, leaning his head over the back of his couch and staring up at the ceiling. Status. He muttered on a whim, calling on the status window, 
he'd figured out how to call and dismiss it on his way back. He blinked as he looked at the stats reflected back at him. Name, Daiki Yurii, age, 13, chakra capacity, 956-956, Genin, strength, 14-500, endurance, 14.2-500, durability, 14-500, agility, 14 out of 500, Taijutsu, 25-500, Ninjutsu, 20-500, Genjutsu, 10-500, Bukijutsu, 15-500, Chakra Control, 30-500, Chakra Affinities, Lightning, not applicable you have no training with this element. His chakra capacity had increased by 20 points, and his endurance by 0.2. It wasn't exactly some massive groundbreaking change, but it really was incredibly interesting to see his abilities grow numerically before his very eyes. A feeling of satisfaction rose up in him. It was odd though. His endurance listed as 14 did look incredibly low, but at the same time it was what he'd gained from training his body since he was but a young boy in the academy. He'd been training since he was four. Sure, 0.2 again wasn't a big massive change, but at the same time, that was a 70th of his total endurance score, gained over 8 years of training. Did this system thing perhaps enhance his rate of growth? Or was that perhaps just a byproduct of him essentially being made of up two different people now? Could potential and talent be measured as such even? Well, no point looking a gift horse in the mouth. He mused, he'd find out in the future through training either way. If so, it did present an opportunity though. He had been a genin for two months now, in four months, the Chunin exams were due to be held and he knew they were due to be held in Kanoha now. I've got enough money to live on for a decent while now I suppose. Daiki mused so he could focus fully on his training, especially now that he'd went through all the information briefings he'd had to sit through the last two months due to being part of the genin corps. The next morning, Daiki dragged himself up off the couch where he'd fallen asleep without even realizing it at the crack of dawn. He threw on a fresh set of clothes, took care of his daily business, ate a light breakfast and then got a move on. He headed straight towards the training grounds and already he could hear the sound of ringing and clashing metal echoing and slight tremors shaking the ground. This'll do. He mused after finding an empty training ground. It was pretty small since it was a higher numbered training ground, but it had a small stream going through it, so if things went well, he could work on the next part of business he wanted to get around to. For now though, he made his way over to one of the large trees surrounding the training field. It was time to get tree walking down. Daiki lifted his foot and focused his chakra into the sole of it, before pressing it to the tree. It stuck firmly for the moment, it wasn't really all that different from the leaf training exercise he learned in the academy it seemed though a bit more challenging since his feet were a lot larger, and his body a lot heavier than a leaf that he could stick to his head with one point. He repeated the motion with his other foot, sticking to it and found himself sticking to to it vertically. Cool. Daiki grinned, he could already imagine all the ways this could help in combat. With that thought in his mind, he lifted his foot from the tree to step up, only for the bark to spontaneously erupt and propel him backwards with quite a bit of force. He flipped through the air and landed on the ground about 10 feet away. Lips pursed. Okay. So not as easy as I thought it would be. Daiki mused. Tree walking really was far more complicated than Daiki thought it would be without proper instruction. It ended up taking him a total of four days to get it down and done with. He couldn't remember exactly how long it took Naruto and Sasuke to finish, but he knew Sakura had done it on her first try. That was frustrating. Was her chakra control just that good, or was it just the fact that her chakra capacity was that minuscule? Surely it isn't anywhere near my own. Daiki consoled himself. Even in the academy, Sakura only ever used Jutsu when called upon, and he'd never seen her at any of the training grounds provided by the academy. Daiki put her out of mind for the moment and wiped the sweat that had formed over his brow. At least I finally got it done. He grinned to himself from where he stood hanging by his feet from a tree over 200 feet high, and he'd actually passed by Naruto this morning on the way here to the training grounds, so he definitely hadn't left for the wave mission yet. That was an accomplishment, right? He'd learned tree walking before any of Team 7 at the very least. Shaking his head, 
Daiki cut off the flow of chakra from his feet and dropped the 200-foot drop to the ground. His feet absorbing the impact of his landing as easy as breathing. I suppose it's been a while. He stroked his chin. He hadn't wanted to check until he finished up with tree walking. Status. Name. Daiki Yuriai. Age. 13. Chakra capacity. 962-1322. Genin. Strength. 14-500. Endurance. 15.3 out of 500. Durability. 14 out of 500. Agility. 14 out of 500. Taijutsu. 25 out of 500. Ninjutsu. 20 out of 500. Jinjutsu. 10 out of 500. Bukijutsu. 15 slash 500. Chakra control. 66.6 slash 500. Chakra affinities frowny face lightning. Not applicable you have no training with this element. His eyes widened as the status screen appeared, and a wide grin appeared on his face. Now that's what I'm talking about. He pumped his fist into the air. Over his time training, he'd noticed how much easier it was to call upon his chakra and use just a specific amount, and how second nature it became to use it to keep sticking to the trees while learning the chakra control exercise. And his efforts had clearly borne fruit. His chakra capacity had grown by nearly a half in a mere four days. His endurance had increased by nearly 10% and his chakra control score had outright doubled. Hell yeah! He cheered, a savage delight filling him. He still couldn't tell if it had increased the rate at which he grew, since he was on the move constantly, using chakra constantly and mastered a control exercise way beyond the leaf-sticking exercise he'd gotten down first time, but with his progress reflected at him here and now in numbers, he felt like he really could do this. What should I do now? Daiki wondered to himself idly stretching out his arms. He still had quite a bit of chakra left in the tank, but he'd just gone through four days of intense training. He should take a break. Then again, I have zero friends. His shoulders slumped. Different life, same story. Huh? It wasn't even like he really had any other goal either, or hobby even. He hadn't been able to afford any decent hobby growing up. The only thing that could even be slightly counted as a goal in his life before had been becoming stronger rising up the ranks and drawing the awe of everyone around to him. Kind of sad really now that he thought about it. Hell, it wasn't even all that different from what Naruto wanted to accomplish. Not that I can really afford to take it easy either. He added and somehow he felt himself slumping even further. He couldn't leave the village without being branded a missing ninja and getting his ass hunted down and chopped up. And in less than four months, the Chunin exams would take place and Orochimaru and Suno would be invading the village. He was in a mess either way he looked at it honestly. Stop being a pussy, you big sloppy pussy. He scolded himself. He wasn't some little kid getting by on a stipend anymore. He could just go on a mission and make more money if he needed it and indulge in a hobby. Maybe pick up a book or go see a movie or something. Aura! Hyping himself up. Daiki pulled his shirt up over his head and kicked off his pants, leaving him in only his boxers before rushing over to the stream at the side of his training ground. Cowabunga baby! He shouted, channeling chakra to the soles of his feet and landing on the water surface. Or at least he tried to. He yelped as he sunk straight through with a big ol' plopping splash. Finna a lily! Daiki's voice echoed throughout the expanse of training ground 69. If anyone passed by at that time, or were just curious about the shouting and came to take look. They would find a young tan and broadly built teenager, soaked to the bone. His dark boxers molded to his skin standing atop the stream within the training ground, crowing his victory to the sky. Seven days, seven freaking days. A whole entire week of nothing but trying to walk on water. He loved training and trying to become the next Jesus as much as the next Shinobi or Kunoichi. But holy crap did it begin to get mind-numbing after a time. He had nothing else better to do. Sure. But holy crap again. It was freaking insane. He was going absolutely stir-crazy spending all this time playing in the water. Crap. I need a break from this crap. Daiki groaned. Plopping his ass right down atop the water. He wobbled a bit on the water as he did. But held on. He so was not in the mood to keep this up any longer. It was normal for Shinobi to train for long, extended period of times, that was for sure. But he needed some damn variety here. The only thing keeping him going here 
was checking his status every so often and watching as some of his numbers rose up and up. It was odd how watching numbers go up relaxed him and made him feel good. But he wasn't complaining it was a bomb to this crappy week. Being a ninja sucks ass man. Daiki groaned internally. He should have just joined a civilian school and learned a trade. He would have probably been way happier with his life. No going back now though, once a ninja, always a ninja and all that nonsense. Plus, he'd totally get squashed by a giant snake come the Chunin exams if he was a civilian. That was just how his luck rolled. He had to clear this downer of a mood. And there was only one thing available for him to do that right now. Status. Name. Daiki Yuriai. Age. 13. Chakra Capacity. 312-1960. Genin. Strength. 14 to 500. Endurance. 16.6 to 500. Durability. 14 out of 500. Agility. 14 out of 500. Taijutsu. 25 out of 500. Ninjutsu. 20 out of 500. Jinjutsu. 10 slash 500. Bukijutsu. 15 slash 500. Chakra Control. 130.4 slash 500. Chakra Affinities. Lightning. Not applicable you have no training with this element. That's the stuff. Daiki groaned in relief as he looked over the status screen. God. Look at his freaking chakra control. It had reached over a hundred. That was freaking amazing. A week and a half of training and here he was more than a fifth of the way to maxing it out. Though it was definitely going to slow down from here. He didn't exactly know any other chakra control exercises. Hell, None even really came up in the series after water walking from what he remembered. Beyond Naruto learning sage mode and how to balance the Kyuubi's chakra. Was there even any other chakra control exercises even? Ones he could use that is. Or was it something he'd just work on passively like he had before getting the status stuff after he mastered the leaf sticking exercise? Perhaps if he learned more jutsu or trained his affinity. Not that there were really any good options for that around here. They wouldn't exactly keep instructions for those in the standard library, right? Either way, beyond that, my chakra capacity has outright doubled since I started. Daiki's grin grew to blinding proportions, before dimming almost as quickly as it appeared. Despite doubling it, it was still labeled as genin level. Man, his chakra capacity must have really been trash before. Hell, he guessed it was still trash. He sighed, his mood was like a yo-yo here. What he'd accomplished here was treated as big turning point for Naruto. A milestone reached more or less that let him jump massively in strength and fighting ability. It didn't feel like a big goal or anything to him though. The only congratulations he was getting were the birds chirping in the trees. F it. I'm so done here man. Daiki hopped up, dismissing his status screen. He was heading home to change his boxers. Then he was gonna do... something. Whatever honestly... Maybe buy a television so he could laze around his house for a bit and relax. Kanoha crush, screw that noise, he was gonna go loopy at this rate. Hell, he'd take a conversation with Irika sensei over being alone much longer. The silence beyond him was stifling. Now that he was a genin, an active shinobi of the leaf village and part of the military, he didn't have to settle for the public library. Instead, he was allowed to access the Kanoha library archive. Daiki made his way back through the village and headed towards the Hokage building, and then passed it. His destination was in fact, built into the Hokage mountain. As soon as he entered the general vicinity of it, multiple green vested shinobi came into view, on guard all around the perimeter. And Daiki was willing to bet his left testicle that there were at least a dozen umbu black ops out of sight that he couldn't detect. Yeff man, he wished he was a censor. Sadly, being a censorine was pretty prestigious and a luck of the draw, it was even rarely ever passed down through blood, and appeared at times just randomly. If he was a natural sensor ninja, he'd probably have got some special attention during the academy. The only way I'm getting sensory abilities is if I learn how to harness natural energy. Daiki huffed annoyance. Multiple's eyes drifted to him as he approached the building built into the side of the mountain. But he only had to point to his headband before he was ushered on inside. A whistle left his lips as the door closed behind him. A whistle that echoed quite impressively. The inside of the building was absolutely huge. All around him he could see huge bookcases as far as the eye could see. 
The only place without bookshelves from what he could tell was the path laid out to the door, leading to a large round table that could probably seat a good 50 people and a desk behind it. First things first, he didn't know where anything was in here. So he made his way to the front desk, where a somewhat familiar older girl wearing a white lab coat and with swirly glasses hiding her eyes sat. If he wasn't mistaken, that was Shiho, right? Part of the Kanoha Crypto Analytics Squad. Hmm, odd, why would she be working as a librarian? Maybe their lab is in this building or under it? He mused. With all the data compiled here in book format, and with how many guards there were and with how close it was to the Hokage's building, kind of made sense. Hello, can I help you? She asked when he stopped in front of the desk. Hiya. Daiki smiled brightly as he greeted her. I'm looking for some books or scrolls to help me with my training. Preferably something with jutsu instructions in it or elemental training. She stared back at him for a moment, lips pursed into a frown. That won't be possible, I'm afraid. While there are a few jutsu instructions scattered about in here, you won't find specific books or scrolls dedicated to teaching them here, the girl replied. And elemental manipulation is a very advanced form of training. It especially won't be open for just anyone to waltz in and have a look at. It would be simply too easy for a spy to get their hands on. Daiki clicked his tongue in annoyance. There went the easy route. Why could nothing ever be simple for him? But there was a line in there he could use, wasn't there? Something was better than nothing after all. Do you know of any that contain instructions for jutsu like you said? He asked wonderingly. He wasn't too picky at all at this point. For an orphan like him with no legacy, there really wasn't any jutsu he could easily get his hands on. If he could even just get his hands on an incredibly low-level elemental jutsu, it would at least give him a feel for it to try and using as a springboard to bounce off from. Hmm. Shiho hummed, tapping her chin. Daiki grimaced, preparing to be told a flat-out no, because that was just how his luck rolled. So H. I do recall one, I think. She nodded suddenly. I believe the instructions for the Shunshin are written within the Taijutsu scroll that helps one learn the Feather Fist style. Feather Fist. Daiki blinked, confused. He'd never heard of that Taijutsu style in his life. Granted, he only knew the Academy style himself, but he knew of the strong fist thanks to his memories of another life, and he of course had overheard talks of clan members Taijutsu because of how many had been in his class, such as the Hyuga's Gentle Fist, the Uchiha's Interceptor style, the Inazuka's Beast Claw style, and such. It's a Taijutsu style for those leaning towards incredibly fast, precise attacks, Best suited for assassin-style shinobi, Shiho shrugged lightly. While it's all but impossible to use the Shunshin freely in combat, it is quite possible to use it for acceleration purposes and it is very handy for escaping from other ninja as long as you are going in a straight line. The Shunshin. Huh? Well, it wasn't exactly what he was aiming for, and it wouldn't be the most helpful in combat unless he had a Sharingan or something like Shursue Uchiha to stop the tunnel vision, but it was definitely a start. Can you show me where it is? Daiki asked. Certainly, please follow me. Shiho stood from her chair and beckoned him to follow her. He did so and she led him through the stacks. She stopped in front of a truly massive bookcase filled with scrolls and books. Here we are. She pointed at the top shelves, where a variety of large scrolls were lined up. He followed her finger and saw one of the scrolls was labeled Feather Fist. Beside it was another one labeled Sticky Fist and then his eyes widened as he caught sight of the next one on the row. Strong fist. Daiki choked. The strong fist is here as well? He sputtered. Wasn't that guy's own created taijutsu, made by his father? Why would it not be? Shiho frowned at him, and though he couldn't see her eyes, he assumed she was looking at him in confusion. The strong fist has always been a Kanoha taijutsu style, though it was incomplete for a long while before a man by the name of Meido Dai the father of one of our famed shinobi, Meido Gai, took it upon himself to complete the style. Oh, that kind of made sense considering Dai was a career genin and really weak. He wouldn't exactly have the resources to create it all himself now, would he? Still really freaking impressive what he turned it into. Doesn't this include how to open the eight gates? Daiki gaped at her. Forget Jutsu. That was some really freaking dangerous information. It does and it does not. Shiho shook her head. It does contain the information on how to prepare your body for opening the gates, but the information to do so has long since been removed from here, 
Only Gaisan and the Hokage have access to the scrolls on that part of the strong fist. Oh, that was good. And not. Learning how to open up the gates on his own would have been amazing. Even just the first few would make a massive boost in his abilities. And as amazing as Guy and Rock Lee were, they only used the gates to empower their physical abilities. From what he knew of them, they also powered up the user's chakra as well, meaning their jutsu would be way more powerful as well. Guy and Lee were horrible at ninjutsu granted. But, in his hands, if he could learn to do so, he could not only enhance his physical ability massively, but also any jutsu he learned to employ. So, am I allowed to take these out of the archive? He asked. You are, though because you seem to only be a genin, you have a hard limit on only two pieces of literature. Shiho replied. To her? Huh? That meant he could take the strong fist and the feather fist. If he wanted, he could learn the shunshin from the feather fist scroll and then see about training in the strong fist. Though maybe just training in the feather fist would be a better avenue? The strong fist, from what he saw of Guy and Lee, involved a heavy, grueling regiment of weight training, though they only did it on the legs for some reason. If I do it, I'll go all in and go for my arms as well. Daiki mused. He didn't like the idea of only training one side of his body for fighting, that seemed silly to him. Still, only two, huh? And he didn't really want to focus on too much at one time. He couldn't exactly just pull a Naruto and use shadow clones to learn at an accelerated rate, so spreading his attention between multiple things would be a bad idea. He already knew how to go about using shadow clones, they were just that simple. He was just absolutely and absurdly wary of attempting them right now with how little chakra he had. Perhaps when he had as much chakra as a chunin he'd attempt it, but as he was right now, he may end up killing himself in the attempt. Might be a good idea to axe learning the strong fist. He mused. The conditioning from what he knew was pretty straightforward. Though best to check just in case. He reached up and grabbed the scroll, before opening it up and poring over it with a quick glancing read. Yeah, pretty much a heavy focus on weight training and general body exercises with a focus on the legs. He nodded to himself. The only thing he'd need the scroll for were the forms and he didn't really need them. Better to get his hands on another scroll or something with a possible jutsu in it. If he wanted to learn how to open the gates, he'd need to ask the Hokage or Guy about it anyway. And he didn't see that going anywhere unless he made a name for himself first. Oh wait, didn't Kakashi know how to open the gates as well? I'd have better chances asking Orochimaru to take me on as an apprentice. Daiki snorted inwardly. Rolling the scroll back up, he put it back up on the shelf before grabbing the Feather Fist style scroll. Tempting, but I'm more interested in Jutsu at the moment, he said to Shiho. So, do you know any other ones with Jutsu in them? Shiho shook her head. I'm afraid not. She dashed his hopes. Damn. Well, that sucks. But the Shunshin is a nice consolation prize either way. Daiki shrugged. And it wasn't like he was totally out of options for learning jutsu either. Beyond the shadow clone jutsu, he did in fact know how to go through some very specific training to learn quite the powerful jutsu, a step-by-step -step process even. De Rasengan. It would be a bit off an odd jutsu for him to know, perhaps even a bit suspicious, but at the same time, there is nothing to say you couldn't have recreated it yourself when trying to make jutsu of your own. It is a pure chakra manipulation jutsu after all. The only problem again is the chakra cost. The Raisingan was an A-rank jutsu and very, very powerful. But also cost an absurd amount of chakra to use, chakra he did not have at the moment. If only he was a Jinchuriki, things would be so much simpler. Sure, the Akatsuki would be a problem, but they were everybody's problem in the end. He'd rather get strong and have a target on his head, than weak and get ganked like he had before by utter random scrubs. Well, thanks for the help. He expressed his gratitude to the older girl. So, can I check this out now? He held up the scroll he was holding to her. That should be fine. Shiho's lips quirked. Though, if you were wanting to know Jutsu so badly, might I make a few suggestions? Daiki blinked, before shrugging. Sure. She nodded. We have a few basic instruction manuals for Fuinjutsu if you want. I can let you check out one of them, the girl said, making his eyes go wide at the mention. And if you have enough chakra control, I know the hospital will help train any possible medic ninja and learning the mystical palm technique is one of the requirements. So if you are able, 
It would be a quick way to get some instruction on that jutsu even if you have no leanings towards being a medic. Daiki's mind raced a mile a minute. The healing of the mystical palm, wouldn't it be able to heal his muscles and allow his physical training to go advance even quicker? But the bigger kicker was Fuinjutsu. Fuinjutsu was awesome. Amazing even. One of the most basic of basic biatch skills from that art was basically making an inventory. Something his system didn't seem to provide him. He checked. Quite thoroughly. And at even higher heights, one could even seal a bijou with Fuinjutsu. And he just so happened to know, more or less, where the Sanbai, the three-tailed armored turtle, Isabu should be now. Daiki grinned widely. I think I'll take you up on that offer, Librarian Chan. See Chan? Shiho sputtered in response. As it turned out, all he really needed to do was give his ninja registration number to check out what he wanted, the scroll on the feather fist style and a manual on basic fuinjutsu. He would have returned home after that, but he decided to head back to his training ground. His water walking was still a bit shaky. So once he got there, he hopped onto the water and idly went through some taijutsu motions, while reading taking a cursory glance over his spoils from the library. Huh. This looks familiar. Daiki mused as he pored over the feather fist style. The diagrams within the scroll that is. They had a heavy leaning on spring like motions with the feet basically bouncing on the feet or leaning forward on the front of the feet to spring towards an opponent and with a focus on using the fists, feet, knees, and elbows for lightning-fast strikes. Isn't this just like kickboxing? He mused. Either way, it was a pretty straightforward style and shouldn't be too hard to learn, especially since it seemed to mesh well with the basic academy style. Though, there was also a lot of information on the best points to strike on the body to debilitate or kill using these types of strikes. His eyes drifted down to the bottom, where some specific instructions lay. Instructions for the Shunshin technique, the vaunted body flicker. Except not really. It was only a vaunted technique in the hands of Uchiha Shusue or Namike's Minato. The instructions for the technique were pretty straightforward as well, though there was a warning that it could be pretty chakra intensive. It was a technique that merely needed one to focus their chakra using the tiger hand seal and then expel their chakra from specific chakra points or tenketsu on the body, located at the back of the body to accelerate. It was basically the same general idea of using thrust like a rocket, only with chakra and a human body. It even mentioned that once one got used to the sensation enough and had a powerful enough chakra, they wouldn't even need the hand seal to focus their chakra enough and it could be used without the seal. He memorized the general forms of the feather fist style and went through them for a while atop the water. He kept it up until his chakra was nearing empty before sitting down atop the water and spending the remaining time he had left before his chakra capacity ran dry pursuing through the Fuinjutsu manual he had been given by Shiho. Within a few minutes, he already felt a headache coming on. The introduction into the book, for the most part, was memorization of basic Fuinjutsu symbols, how they reacted to chakra and how they overlapped with one another. It was almost like looking at coding for the first time, and he wanted to give up right then and there, because freaking hell did it look complicated. He didn't though, because instead of coding stupid computer programs, this could let him code symbols together that would let him obtain the power of what may as well be a force of nature. And hey, the book outright had a diagram for creating storage seals and explosive seals. That was freaking epic. He'd need to get some good paper and ink though first. So, once his chakra pretty much dwindled away to near nothing, he hopped off the river, much more steadily now and made his way back into the village, into the shopping sector. He stopped by a calligraphy shop and spent 10,000 Rio on supplies, paper, ink and brushes and such. He was about to head on home, when he caught sight of a shinobi store, swords and more shown proudly in the windows. Should I? Daiki pondered to himself. He was fine on kanai, shuriken, ninja wire and such for now, but this was the type of shop that would sell body weights for training. They'd probably cost a pretty penny though, which meant he'd have to go on another few missions to make up for his dwindling funds soon. A few missions won't hurt, I suppose. He mused. He'd definitely be sticking to missions in the land of fire, though, if he could, at least. Because to hell with heading out alone again until he was much stronger. He headed into the shop, ignoring the various displays of weaponry and headed over to the shopkeep standing behind the counter. An older man with a large fuzzy beard, quite short, but with a bulky build and huge muscular arms. Something you need, boy? The man asked, raising an eyebrow. 
I'm looking for body weights to help condition myself, Daiki replied. Preferably ones for my legs and arms. Yeah, we've got M. The man shrugged. What kind of weight are you looking for? Have you done much weight training before? Some. Daiki replied, though in another life, the Ninja Academy only focused on basic physical conditioning all-rounder type, though many leaned into one or two specifications on that aspect of training by pure instinct and body type. I see that I suppose you've got a pretty good build on you. The shopkeep eyed his broad shoulders beyond the Rotun Choji. He was by far the broadest in his graduating class, only Naruto and Kiba having a chance of competing on that route. What are you looking for? Strength building. I'm an all-rounder. Despite my looks, Daiki laughed lightly. Not only strength, but I want to focus on speed and the like as well. If the rakage could do it, why not him? Heck, he even had the lightning element as his affinity. God, he'd love to get his hands on the lightning armor technique. Right, I suppose then a pair of ankle weights and wrist weights, each one weighing 300 pounds would fit for you to start off with. The man stroked his chin and nodded. Bit heavier than your standard beginner fare, but with your build, I'm sure it'll be fine. Fine with me? Daiki shrugged. How much will they cost? A total of 1,200 pounds spread across four limbs. That was doable, it would take a bit to get used to it. He could lift over 600 pounds when he graduated the academy after all. They were double that amount, but half of that would be on his legs and not all on his arms, so it should be fine. Besides, he'd seen people calculate how much weight Rock Lee wore during the Chunin exams. People had calculated it to be around 5 tons on each leg. It would be too embarrassing for him to bear if he couldn't even lift what amounted to a twentieth of what Rock Lee could with just his legs, using his basically his whole body. Eh, 150,000 Rio, pretty cheap compared to the heavier crap. The man shrugged. Daiki winced. He'd have less than 94,000 Rio left. He'd definitely need to take a few missions to boost his funds. I'll take them. Daiki sighed. The things I do for strength. He shook his head. Not everyone could be Rock Lee and have a famous and powerful Jonin take interest in him just because he tried hard despite being untalented. Such bullcrap. All right, one moment. The shopkeep nodded and made his way through a door behind him into the back of the store. He came back out a few minutes later with what looked like two sets of pale straps, each about 10 inches long, with heavy a multitude of rectangular ridges popping up over them. Right, each of these pockets contain heavy metal weights within them to add the weight to these. They have some sealed doohickeys on them that increase weight or whatever. That's why they're so expensive compared to normal weights. The shopkeep explained. Once Daiki paid for them, the man handed them over, and the genin took the time to strap them on. They feel all right? The man asked him once he was done. Daiki lifted his arms up and down a few times, then repeated with his legs, getting a feel for the weight. There was a definite massive resistance, but it was manageable. Yeah, they're great. He grinned. He headed home from there for the most part, only stopping to run through some basic exercises to tire himself out and get a bit more used to the weights. Some people gave him funny looks, but he ignored them. He was much more focused on the gains these would give him. By time he locked the door of his house behind him and collapsed on his couch. Dusk was already beginning to fall. Ah, crap, he groaned. I totally forgot to get some books to read. The only crap he had in his crappy little apartment were his textbooks and crap from the academy and some children's stories. And he also needed to make dinner. But he honestly just couldn't be effed right now. Ah, eff it, I'll do it later. Daiki slumped back onto the couch and decided to just take a look at his progress by calling up his status screen. Name? Daiki Yuriai. Age? 13. Chakra Capacity. 412 slash 2200, Genin. Strength, 15 to 500, Endurance. 19.6 out of 500, Durability. 15 out of 500, Agility. 15 out of 500, Taijutsu. 45 out of 500, Ninjutsu. 20 out of 500, Jinjutsu. 10 out of 500, Bokujutsu. 15 slash 500, Chakra Control. 132.4 slash 500 Chakra Affinities Lightning Not applicable you have no training with this element Few in Jutsu Dash Maybe try learning a few seals? Wait what? There were some interesting things to take there 
His chakra capacity had broken 2000, yet was still genentier, his physical stats had increased pretty noticeably. His taijutsu stat had almost doubled, which was interesting. The basic forms for the feather fist were easy to get down, but it wasn't like he had mastered the fighting style or something, not even close. Was it maybe because the feather fist style was just that much better than the academy style maybe? Honestly, a lot about this stupid status thing still confused the crap out of him. Perhaps the most interesting thing though, was that he now had a few injutsu skill? Ability? Is things sassing me? Daiki gaped at the screen. The more he thought he knew about this thing, the less he knew. Was it sentient? Or was it just his subconscious mocking him? Something was off here. Laying across a tree branch in his chosen training ground, there was a frown on Daiki's face. It had been ten days since he'd visited the Shinobi Library Archive. With a new ninjutsu to learn, a new taijutsu style to focus on, study material to pour over and physical conditioning to lose himself in, he'd thrown himself into training. It was so easy to lose himself in the training when he had actual things to learn and strive towards and see the ever-increasing numbers the status screen reflected back at him. The increases he gained were amazing, but odd very odd. Name? Daiki Yurii. Age? 13. Chakra Capacity? 4700 slash 4700 Elite Genin. Strength. 23.8 out of 500. Endurance. 32.8 out of 500. Durability. 23.8 out of 500. Agility. 23.8 out of 500. Taijutsu. 99 slash 500. Ninjutsu. 30 slash 500. Jinjutsu. 10 out of 500. Bukajutsu. 15 out of 500 Chakra Control 146 slash 500 Chakra Affinities Lightning Not applicable you have no training with this element. Fuinjutsu Novice you have reached the level of a novice. His physical abilities had increased by around 50% give or take, his chakra control had grown a decent little bit, and his chakra capacity had outright doubled once more. Only, it was now listed as Elite Genin meaning more than five times the amount of chakra he had when he woke up, still didn't compare to a chunin. The scope of things was getting harder and harder to judge. If this amount was only elite genin, then just how absurd of an amount did the Hokage have or the likes of Naruto? But putting that out of mind, the most explosive growth of all was his taijutsu score, it had outright doubled as well in the past ten days. The thing was, he'd broken into the 90s four days ago. Since then, it was like pulling teeth trying to increase it, even training himself into the dirt going through the feather fist forms every day until he dropped, netted a two or three point increase. I suppose there's only so fast I can grow going through the forms over and over. He mused. He had no experience using it in a proper fight. Well, he'd probably get the chance sometime soon to test it out. He was running pretty low on funds, he only had a bit over 40,000 Rio left right now, it would probably do him another week, a week and a half at most before he needed to hit up a mission. Still, cowardly as it may be, he found himself leery of going on any missions that might see him meeting other shinobi in combat. Delivery missions tended to lead out of the land of fire, so they were out for now. He supposed he could just stick to D-ranks for a bit, or see about any other C-ranks close to the village. Maybe he'd be lucky and there'd be a group of bandits or something cooped up somewhere. They'd probably be closer to the daimyo's court though in the capital and the smaller villages near it rather than close to Kanoha. There wasn't much else he had to do right now beyond continue with his training while he was hitting a kind of soft cap in his taijutsu and such that didn't mean his physical conditioning was the same and of course there was his fuinjutsu studies. He'd managed to learn how to make storage seals and he was so so close to being able to make explosive seals successfully, only 50% of them blew up in his face now. I suppose there's the hospital like Shiho said. Daiki thought, banishing the status screen with a thought. The mystical palm jutsu would be an amazing help, not only for increasing his training gains and dealing with injuries but also, it was the jutsu Noera Rin used to implant Hataki Kakashi's Sharingan. There was no way he could see him getting his hands on any Sharingan. The only ones who had them were Danzo and Tobi or rather Abito, and maybe Orochimaru. But yeah, Getting his hands on any of their possessions was a pipe dream. They were all Kage-level shinobi. To hell with that noise. At the same time, though, it wasn't like the Sharingan was the only dojitsu around. It may be scummy, 
but he'd confirmed the existence of a current rogue shinobi, among others. One by the name of Kurosaki Raiga, the current holder of the Kiba Blades. One of the legendary Seven Swordsman Blades, or two of them he supposed, which would go very well with his lightning affinity now, wouldn't it? The scummy part was, he knew of a convenient, weak target with a very interesting set of eyes who was with Raiga. He would kill two birds with one shuriken. Not that he was set on the path, it was just an option that was open to him. It would be a long while before he was capable of hunting and killing a member of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist after all, even if it was the weakest of them all. Alright, first mystic palm, then I'll do a mission, Daiki decided on, slipping off of the tree branch and dropping to the ground, then disappearing in a blur of speed as he made his way back into the main village area and towards the hospital. When he arrived at the hospital, he couldn't really think of how to go about things beyond asking the nurse stationed at the front reception desk about it. Thankfully, she was quite helpful and directed him towards the right wing of the hospital, to the very top just below the rooftop. It was quite a big building, and on the way he even noticed a familiar pair of water storage tanks that got blown open during a certain fight. The area he was directed to was a long winding corridor, leading towards a pair of large double doors. In front of the doors, two scrub-wearing ninjas stood on either side, guarding it. Because he couldn't sense chakra and the fact they were wearing scrubs and nothing else, he couldn't really gauge what level of shinobi they were, but, going by the fact they were both grown men, he'd say Chunin going with his gut. Is there something you need? The one on the right asked. Yeah. Daiki grimaced a bit, trying to figure out what to say, before deciding on just being upfront. I got sent over this way by the nurse at reception, I'm looking to see about getting some medic ninja training. Their faces were utterly covered beyond their eyes. But he still made out an eyebrow raising. Huh. Don't see much kids your age nowadays trying to learn this. Good on you? The man chuckled. The only other one your age attempting the training currently is that bun-haired girl that's failed three times now over the past year to get the mystic palm technique down. Huh, that would be Ten-Ten? He remembered she had an arc where she wanted to learn Mednin Jutsu to be like Tsunade but lacked the chakra control and that was why she went into learning how to use Fuinjutsu to back up her Bukajutsu. Weird. Seems like really useful stuff to know. Daiki replied with a shrug. Well, kids your age are more interested in learning how to breath fireballs and shoot lightning bolts. The man snorted. He then reached into his scrubs and pulled out a rolled up scroll. Still, despite your interest, you still gotta learn this jutsu. Come back when you think you have and we'll test you. This is the basic qualification you need to be a medic ninja. If you can't even learn this, well, you can't, simple as that. Daiki raised an eyebrow, but caught the scroll when it was tossed towards him. You just keep these on hand to give out? He asked dubiously. The medic ninja shrugged. The head medic is a testy guy, very busy, always on the move and seeing to patients, he replied. He set it up this way so he wouldn't be bothered by anybody, but those that have the potential to be medic ninja. Daiki grimaced, a voice floating through his ears as he remembered his genin test. Look, I have a lot of duties and some special things I want to pass on. I'm looking for those with great potential. If you can't even land a single hit on me, three on one at your age, then that ain't you guys, so come at me, you have one hour. Freaking Genma. Right, I'll get back to you then when I'm done with this, thanks. He pushed those thoughts to the back of his mind and bid goodbye to the two medic ninja guards and continued on his way. He unrolled the scroll as he walked, idly reading through it as he made his way outside. At the very top, the scroll went into the name of the jutsu and the general uses, and there were quite a lot. While it couldn't set broken bones, it could mend them if provided enough chakra. It could also repair skin tissue, reconnect nerves, and more among other things. It was recommended that one must have mastered the tree walking and water walking exercises before attempting the jutsu and even then, that wasn't a surefire way indication of being able to learn the jutsu. As far as hand seals went, there were only two, a pair of modified variations of the ox and tiger seals. And listed at the bottom was the test he would have to pass. He would have to use it, to save the life of a large fish that had been stabbed and left out of water to suffocate. Poor fish, that was some hardcore crap. Back to the training ground, I suppose. Daiki sighed. This was probably going to take a decent while if the time it took him to learn tree walking and water walking was anything to go by. Seven days, a week by any other words, on the dot. That was how long it took. Seven goddamn days. 
His wallet was running on empty at this point. Seriously, he only had 9,000 Rio left. It was kind of demoralizing to see his money so low after having such a nice nest egg just a month ago. But he'd done it, he'd gotten the jutsu down and made those numbers rise nicely in the process. He'd even made a cut in his palm with a kanai and healed it just to make sure he'd gotten it down. Name? Daiki Yuriai. Age? 13. Chakra Capacity. 5420-6400, Elite Genin. Strength? 31 to 500. Endurance? 47 to 500. Durability? 31 out of 500. Agility? 31 out of 500. Taijutsu. 105 slash 500. Ninjutsu. 55 out of 500. Jinjutsu. 10 out of 500. Bukajutsu. 15 slash 500. Chakra control. 155 slash 500. Chakra affinities. Lightning. Not applicable you have no training with this element. Kyuinjutsu. Novice you have reached the level of a novice Taijutsu had finally broken 100 in Ninjutsu over 50, and all his physical stats had broken to over 30. In a month, in pure physical ability alone, he'd become twice as strong. That was kind of amazing, really. And he'd even finally managed to cut down on his margin of errors with explosive tags and could more or less make them on the fly. Well, if on the fly meant sitting incredibly still and concentrating for 5 minutes but semantics, well, I've not used that much chakra, so I should be fine to go for now. Daiki hummed, stretching out his arms. Well, first before he went and grabbed a mission, he had to head home and leave his weights behind. He wasn't confident enough to continue wearing them on a mission. It didn't really take long, and he luxuriated in the feeling of being free of his weights. It almost felt like he was flying through the air with how fast he moved with them off. He arrived at the Hokage building quickly, nodded at the guard stationed at the front doors and made his way inside, and made a prompt right turn, making his way towards the mission admission room. When he entered, it was to see the Hokage himself sitting at the main desk, many a shinobi spread out over other desks. Ah, young Daikikoen. The Hokage? Haruzen Saratobi greeted him with a warm smile as he entered and made his way towards the desk. It's been a month now since I last saw you. How are you? Things have been good, Hokage-sama. Daiki bowed his head respectfully. I decided to spend the last month honing myself and becoming much stronger. I was shown just how weak I really was on the last mission. You are young. Don't feel too rushed, my boy. Haruzen chuckled lightly. Though, I do have to admit, it seems you have been training incredibly hard. Your chakra has grown tremendously since I last saw you. He noticed right away. Huh? As expected of the Hokage. Amazing even that he even bothered to remember a weak nobody like himself. I was offered some tips by an older shinobi when I saw him walking over water. He gave me a brief explanation of the tree walking and water walking techniques. Daiki replied as explanation. On top of that, at the suggestion of the librarian at the archive, I applied to gain medic ninja training and have since learned the mystical palm jutsu and have been expending my chakra to the very limit every single day. Impressive, such dedication to your training, Sarutobi complimented. Perhaps you'll be the new head medic one day, surpass even my old student? He mused warmly. Daiki felt his cheeks flush at the warmth the man just seemed to emit and ducked his head. I doubted Hokage-sama. I was more interested in just the mystical palm jutsu to augment my training for use in the field. I see, I see, that's quite smart of you. Sarutobi gave a small clap. Though enough from this old fossil, I'm sure you came here for a mission and not to have me prod at you all day. No, I'm quite happy to speak to you, Hokage-sama, whenever you want. Daiki's head shot up on instinct and he assured the red and white robed elderly man. Actually, there was a question I was hoping you could answer for me. Oh! Sarutobi raised an eyebrow. I'm all ears my boy fire away, if I can answer I shall. Thank you, the teen replied. It's about elemental jutsu, or rather, training for elemental jutsu. I have recently found out I have an affinity for the lightning element and was hoping you could tell me how I would go about training it. My, my, you do not aim low, do you? Elemental manipulation at your age? Impressive, Sarutobi chuckled. Honestly, I do think it is a bit too soon for you, but I can give you some tips. The key to changing your chakra into lightning chakra is friction. 
forcing your chakra to rub against itself more or less at high speeds, in a way akin to how electricity can be generated. Daiki's eyes widened. That was so simple. How did he not figure that out? I see. Thank you Hokage-sama. This will be amazing for my training. Well, I'll hope to see your progress in person one day soon then. The Hokage chortled lightly and waved off his thanks. Now, what kind of mission are you interested in today? A D rank? Or perhaps a C rank? He honestly needed the money, so a C rank would be his best bet. I'm hoping to compete in the next Chunin exams, so accumulating C ranks is what I'll be aiming towards. Daiki replied. So yes, a C rank please. Haruzan shook his head in amusement. Aiming to compete in the Chunin exams as a rookie? Your ambition is not small, he replied, before rifling through a few stacks of paper in front of him. What kind would you like? I'll be keeping them generally low-level C ranks, of course. We have a few delivery missions, and one bandit extermination mission request from the land of Nyx. He almost shuddered at the thought of a delivery mission. His last attempt at one saw him murdered after all. But bandit extermination in the land of Nex? That was interesting. For one, it was on the way to Suna by his reckoning. So very very unlikely he'd run into any of those stone-humping jerks. But more than that, wasn't there a mission Naruto did in the land of Nex? Where he ran into a massive chameleon summon disguised as a castle, holding the summoning scroll for its clan within. If he remembered right, the chameleon was absolutely massive, possibly bigger than Gamabunta, there was no doubt it was a boss summon. It was risky to go anywhere near a boss summon with as weak as he was right now. But, if he could earn its allegiance, and he knew the spirit of its summoner was bound around for some reason, which made it plausible the possibilities. It was high risk and high reward. I'll take the bandit extermination mission, Hokage-sama. Daiki decided. Besides, he needed to get used to killing other humans. Bandits would be the best step to get started with on that front. And he'd be helping innocent people being terrorized by bandits. Everybody wins. Except the bandits, but they were bandits, so who cared about them? Very well. The Hokage rolled up a scroll and passed it over to him. The client is currently staying within the village and will remain here until the completion of the mission. You do not need to take anyone with you or guard anyone. You are free to approach this mission as you please. Upon the completion of the mission, once you return, the client will then hand over the payment to us. Daiki accepted the scroll and bowed his head. I'll grab my gear and head out straight away Hokage-sama, he replied. Be careful out there Daiki, even bandits can be dangerous. The old man warned him. Daiki thanked him once more after accepting his words and left to prepare for his mission. All things considered, it didn't take him very long to reach his destination. The land of Nex was just outside the border of the land of fire, right in between the small blank territory between it and the land of wind. The location of the bandits had already been mapped out and everything, they had taken up residence in an old outpost that hadn't really seen use in decades. The land of Nex didn't have shinobi anymore to man it. They'd long since lost their small shinobi village during the prelude to the second shinobi world war. If Daiki remembered correctly, the summoner of the chameleon clan, was the last living shinobi of the land of Nex and his last act was to summon the chameleon boss summon. Either way, he'd moved at a fast pace, and by time the sun was beginning to set, he arrived at his destination. That was four and a half hours ago. Currently, Daiki found himself perched atop the branch of a large tree, hidden within the thick leafy foliage, and observed the outpost the bandits had taken over. It wasn't anything special, a small output a few hundred feet in length and across, surrounded by wooden walls. There were a few platforms with torches inside, but they were left unmanned. Sloppy. Or ignorant. Maybe just plain stupid. Daiki snorted. As it was, the only guards they had stationed at all were two men left at the gates. They seemed to switch over with another pair of men every three hours from what he gathered. From his observations, there were roughly thirty members in the bandit tribe, which matched up with the estimates on the mission scroll. There was one outlier, though. He didn't know if it was misinformation, they were lied to about the mission details for a lower price, or if it was simply something new altogether. They had a leader, and it wasn't just a common bandit. It was a burly, dark-skinned man with ragged pale blonde hair. A burly, 
dark-skinned man that wore a white-clothed headband bearing the symbol of Kumo, with a slash dashed through said symbol, a missing mean, thankfully not a very strong one by general standards. He hadn't even been able to locate Daiki hiding in the tree he was in. Sure, Kanoha Ninja were the best of the best at tree hopping and hiding within trees, but it wasn't like he was a particularly overly skilled stealth type shinobi. He upper middle in the rankings of his graduating class after all. Naruto had been the top of that field for their class, the only one he was top of in their class. Daiki looked down at the book he held in his grasp. A bingo book they were issued to all members of the Genin Corps. Name, Kamaya Gakazu Age, 24 rank, Genin Thread Estimation, D-Rank Target Information, a rank and file shinobi, trained mostly in the arts of Kenjutsu, with little jutsu to speak of beyond the basics, wanted for the murder of his teammate before fleeing the village of Kimogakure. Reward, 150,000 Ryo basically, for all intents and purposes, he was a career genin, nobody special. But then again, I'm nobody special either. Daiki mused. The question to be asked though, was he more special than Kamaya Gakazu? Well, either way, the man had pitiful detection skills, not even able to notice a genin watching his camp for hours. Daiki was confident in his ability to wipe out the bandits without the man ever noticing. As long as he did it quietly and didn't venture into the main hut of the outpost where the former Kumo Shinobi had retreated to an hour ago, there were really three options to him. He could get in, kill the bandits and leave, as was the mission, he could kill the bandits then go for the shinobi's head as well, or he could return back to the village and report the change in circumstances. Option three would be the safe bet, but also the biatch option. If I'm too afraid to even take on a career genin, how the hell am I going to get strong enough to survive the crap that's coming? He grimaced at the thought. He was leery of fighting other shinobi right now, especially after what happened to him with those IWA rock humper punks. No, he wanted to go for this guy's head. It would work as a test for him. To see if he had what it took to actually accomplish what he wanted. Besides, he was well equipped for this. He had his kanai, his shuriken, some smoke bombs, a single ceiling scroll made by him and even a few explosive tags of his own making, one even already wrapped around a kanai handle and prepped to be tossed on the fly. And on top of all that, the element of surprise was on his side. And on the plus side, the mission details were just to take care of the bandits. So any valuables they had were free for the taking. Let's do this. Daiki nodded to himself, standing up and stowing the bingo book in his supply pouch, before drawing two shuriken. He edged close towards the edge of the branch and lined his arm up, then whipped it outwards. The two shuriken left his hand in a blur, and a few split moments later, pierced into the jugulars of both bandits guarding the entrance. They toppled to the ground together, dead. For a moment, Daiki just stared, and found he didn't really feel anything from killing them. They were just bandits after all. He felt more emotion slitting the throat of the bunny the academy had presented to him in his final year to get him used to killing. He hopped off of the tree branch and descended towards the ground within the outpost, landing a second later, on the tips of his toes behind one of the huts, making not a sound. There weren't any bandits out and about besides a few of them sitting together in the middle of the outpost, drinking alcohol around a campfire. He drew a pair of kanai and got to work. It was almost absurd how easy it was to sneak up on the bandits outside, a pair of kanai through the back throat of two of them, and then before the other could even realize his pals were dead, he had his throat slit and didn't even have the option to make a sound. And the rest spread around the outpost huts were just as easy especially since the vast majority of them were sound asleep. And a simple transformation into one of the bandits outside was enough to make the awake ones drop their guard and allow him to murder them before they could even realize what was going on. All they had to them were weapons, little to no training at all to make them worth anything within combat in this world. They were unremarkable in every single way, right down to their weapons. There was like no individuality in them, every single one of them had common iron swords, and only a few of them even carried any spare weapons in a few daggers. Who even used daggers these days? Kanai were cheaper and easier to get your hands. Dumb freaks. In total, by the time he was done and looted them for all they were worth, he found himself the proud new owner of 32 common swords and 3 daggers. And all they had between them was 30,000 Ryo. 
the cheap, poor freaks. Seemed their boss was keeping anything of value to himself. All the bandits were dead within less than five minutes. Shinobi, even ones as weak as he, were just that far above the common populace. He sat down at the fire, where the corpses of the bandits outside lay around him and eyed the main hut where the leader was. His mind was half on how he'd approach killing the man, and half on the fact that he'd received no notifications or anything. Which meant he probably hadn't gained something like experience for killing them. As usual, this game system of his was quite different from anything he'd seen in actual games or stories. But just in case, status. He thought. Name? Daiki Yuriai. Age? 13. Chakra Capacity. 6500 slash 6500 Elite Genin. Strength? 31 to 500. Endurance. 47.2 out of 500. Durability. 31 out of 500. Agility. 31 out of 500. Taijutsu. 105 slash 500. Ninjutsu. 55 slash 500. Jinjutsu. 10 slash 500. Bukijutsu. 15.3 slash 500. Chakra Control. 155 out of 500. Chakra Affinities. Lightning. Not applicable you have no training with this element. Fuinjutsu. Novice you have reached the level of a novice. Yeah, as expected. His endurance and chakra capacity had increased a tiny bit, and even his bukajutsu had went up a sliver which kind of made sense it was his first time using his weapons to kill. But nothing like experience or leveling up that made his stats go through a drastic change. Well, whatever. It told him some things but opened up many more questions about this thing. Could it possibly be some form of bloodline? And that didn't matter right now. He had a former Kumo Shinobi to kill. Well, either way, as far as the missing Nin went, there was no point in fighting him if he didn't have to, to kill him. Shinobi combat wasn't all about head on Taijutsu and Ninjutsu exchanges. Daiki reached into his supply pouch and drew the four explosive tags he had left, before creeping over to the main hut stealthily and planting one on each side of the small building. Then, he made his way back over to the fire and drew the one kanai he had already wrapped with a tag and smirked. Boom, baby! He chuckled, before running his chakra through the tag to ignite it and toss through the window of the hut. A moment later, the insides of the small building erupted into an explosion, triggering and detonating the other four explosion tags, enveloping the small building in a massive explosion. Debris flew through the air as the building itself was destroyed and Daiki tensed, preparing to shoot forward with a body flicker and lay into the man with all his strength. Yet as he stood there, tense and ready to act at a moment's notice, ten seconds passed by, then thirty, and before he knew it an entire minute with no sign of movement. And by then the smoke from the explosions began to die down. Soon, the remnants of the of the hut came into view, more or less a pile of rubble and wrecked furniture remnants, and laying sprawled within the rubble, half submerged, half not, was the charred corpse of Kamaya Gakazu. Daiki blinked. That was easy? Way, way easier than he was expecting. He thought he would be having some epic fight with this guy who would be injured and all in a rage. But no, he was just dead. Then again, he had basically hit him with what amounted to five grenades and pulled a small building down on top of him. Tough as shinobi were, this guy was still just a genin like him and not an impressive one like Sasuke or something, he was just a scrub. So it kind of made sense? Shaking his head, Daiki made his way over and pulled the corpse out of the rubble. His skin was lightly smoking and his eyes were rolled up into the back of his head. The skin on his face charred and burnt. Hell, his gear seemed to be in better condition than he was. A typical white-handled Kumo blade that they all seemed to have and a pair of charred weapon and supply pouches. He sealed the sword in his sealing scroll before rifling through his pouches. He found some kanai, some shuriken, a spool of ninja wire, a total of 55,000 Rio. Hello? What's this? Daiki blinked as he observed the last item he found. A small rolled up scroll. He opened it up and his eyes widened in shock. Holy crap! He gaped. Reflected back at him was the title. Birank Lightning Style. Electromagnetic Murder. It was the instructions for a lightning style jutsu. And one he even knew of. Holy crap what was his luck here man? Quickly, 
he sealed it away in his scroll with the rest of his loot. Before bringing out one of the swords and cutting the man's head off and doing the same with it, his heart beating rapidly with excitement, and not even thinking of what he just did, he retreated back to the tree he'd hid in for the last few hours. As much as Daiki would love to get around to learning the new jutsu he'd just come across right away. He couldn't exactly do that while so far outside the village. Well, it was fine either way, since it wouldn't be long before he returned to the village and got around to it. Before then though, he had one more objective to get around to. Done with his mission, and with the initial excitement of what he found dwindling away, Daiki made his way towards Kubisaki Pass, the former capital of the land of Nek and where the once daimyo and former head shinobi of the land resided in a castle of his own back in the day. From what he remembered from his geography classes in the academy, the shinobi forces of the land of Nek was wiped out just before the Second World Shinobi War, by Tanagakyur, the village hidden in the valley. Tanagakyur was a once shinobi village of the land of rivers, and they by order of their daimyo, had invaded the land of Nex to expand their territory. Being right in between both the land of wind and land of fire, had them feeling threatened constantly. Tanagakyur were wiped out themselves during the second war, by Kanoha in fact in response to their attack on the land of Nex, because they were allied with his his village. There it is. Daiki spotted his destination less than a half an hour after leaving the bandit camp behind. It was a pretty small country after all. Jutting out high over the trees, about 250 feet high, was a large dark colored castle. His target, the chameleon summon Shiromari. If I remember right, the summoning scroll should be located at the very top, within the tower. Daiki mused, eyeing the jutting tower of the castle rising high into the air. Destroying the scroll would send Shiromari back to the Summon Realm, but that would be such a waste. He had to admit though, Shiromari was incredible at blending in. He couldn't feel anything off at all just looking at the castle form the Summon had taken on. Well, if one thing was expected of a Chameleon Summon, it would be blending in he supposed. There were two ways this could go. Either way, he was probably going to get attacked by Shiromari which wasn't of the good, he was nowhere near strong enough to fight a boss summon, and it definitely was the boss summon, no other summon would have the clan summoning scroll on hand. The first option was after he got his hands on the scroll, he could reason with Shiromari and calm the summon down. Mentioning my home village slaughtered his previous master's enemies might get me a bit of goodwill. He mused. The second option was that he was unable to calm the summon down and would have to book it back to Kanoha and rely on his fellow shinobi to protect him and ward the boss summon off. That, or it giving up after he fled. Either way, he was gonna sign his name on that contract tonight. Hmm. Daiki's eyes narrowed as he eyed the castle in thought. The quickest and safest method would be to break into the tower from the outside and get out with the scroll quickly and not risk being caught in Shiromari's stomach. But, he'd come across as a common thief if he did that, and wouldn't exactly endear himself to the chameleon summon by smashing a hole in it. So the best option would probably be to just enter from the front and make his way up the tower. Well, at the very least, Shiromori didn't immediately jump to trying to kill Naruto, Hinata, and Kiba when they entered it. So he had that going for him at least. Jumping out of the tree, Daiki walked towards the castle, up the stairs and grasped the handle of the door, before pulling it open and entering it. A whistle left him as he stepped in. Pretty swank design. He had to admit that. Large, Gleaming purple tilted floor, extravagant paintings, vases and such lining the walls as decorations. Considering this was based on the previous summoner's original castle, Daiki had to give the man props. Even from just the hallway alone, he admitted the man had some nice taste. Keeping his senses alert, Daiki did as he planned and made his way over to the interior staircase and made his way up. He ignored the middle floors the stairs branched out to, and continued on to the very top. And not long later he arrived at his destination. It was a small room located at the very top of the tower, dimly lit, with a small shrine in the middle, and atop a small pedestal, sat a very large dark green scroll. The Chameleon Summoning Scroll. It really is a summoning scroll. Daiki made a show of being surprised, and walked over towards it. He already had a plan and convenient excuse for how he knew about it to put into action. Thank you bandit group. Thank you dead former Kumo Shinobi. What was his name again? And not important. 
On the binder of the scroll, he could see the design of a dark inked chameleon with its tail curled and its long tongue stretched out. Daiki unfurled the scroll, and in multiple different columns, he saw dozens of names, written in blood. The last one being Kubasaki Koza. Kubasaki Koza, I've read about this guy. Daiki hummed, making a show of it. But at least here, he wasn't lying. I don't know how much it'll mean to you now that you're gone already, but we of Kanoha got your revenge for you, we wiped out Tanagakir in retribution for you. Clapping his hands together, Daiki bowed his head and said a short prayer for the man's memory. It was the least he could do for the man that left something so valuable behind for him. Really, Daiki was incredibly grateful to him. If he ever met the guy in the pure world, he'd be sure to buy the guy a drink. With the prayer done with, Daiki wasted no time. He bit his thumb, cutting it and making it bleed, and then wrote his name on the scroll. He rolled up the summoning contract scroll and carried it under his arm and waited for a moment. He almost expected the walls to turn into the fleshy insides of a chameleon's stomach and try and digest him. But nope. Nothing. Well, thank crap for that. Today sure was a lucky, lucky day. It seemed Shiromori had no interest in devouring him like all the other poor souls that ended up trapped inside him. Not looking a gift horse in the mouth, Daiki made his way back down the stairs, right down to the very bottom, and made a beeline for the front doors. He breathed a deep sigh of relief that he didn't even know he was holding within himself when he got outside and made his way down the outer stairs. He paused at the bottom of the stairs and turned around to stare up at the castle, pursing his lips in thought. He was free to go with the scroll, it seemed. But, if he didn't do anything about this right now, he wouldn't be able to summon the actual boss itself. Well, he had a rough plan for this at least, so he could try it out, no sense and not since it seemed like Shiromori was okay with him. You're not a castle at all, are you? He spoke aloud. I know this castle was destroyed a good 50 years ago, and there's a ton of rumors going on about you. Heck, I heard a guy talking about you early on, claiming he knew you were a summon, and that was why he wasn't taking over the empty castle out here. There was no response. Just the drifting of the wind in his ears and not a shift at all in the castle. But he felt the hairs on his arms tingle, as if he was being watched by someone he couldn't see. So Daiki pushed on. And going by the summoning scroll I just found, it kind of adds up, doesn't it? The Genin mused. You're one of the Chameleon clan summons, right? For a moment, nothing happened. And for that moment, he thought maybe it was a lost cause. But then, an audible sigh resonated through the air, entering his ears. It was loud and rumbling, as expected of a creature that size. And what of it? A deep, masculine voice emanated from the castle. I allowed you to take the scroll. You should just count your lucky stars you spoke up when you did before you signed your name on the scroll, or I would have devoured you like so many others. Zatso? Daiki's lips quirked up into a sardonic smile. Am I right in assuming you're the boss of Chameleon Clan? A huff came from the castle. Indeed, my name is Shiromori, proud leader of the Chameleon Clan. The summon disguised as a castle introduced himself. Now you may go new summoner. You can work out the deal between yourself and my clan alone. I have a duty to uphold, tasked by my former master, your predecessor. Yeah, thanks for letting me sign my name on the scroll, by the way. Daiki replied before frowning. But, you have to have been here for 50 years now, why? I am merely performing the task my former master gave me. I will devour all of his enemies, Shiromori declared proudly. Well, if nothing else, Daiki had to praise it or rather his sheer loyalty. If you're talking about Tanagakir, the guys who killed off your master and his followers, they're all dead, Daiki pointed out, reinforcing what he said earlier. Not a single person from that village is alive. We slaughtered them down to every man, woman and child. There are no enemies of your master left for you to kill. It wasn't exactly written that way in the textbooks, but reading between the lines it was easy to see. Shiromori was silent for a moment. Not a single one? Despite how powerful and masculine the summon's voice sounded, Shiromori wasn't able to hide the slack crack in his voice at the question. I said so before, didn't I? We of Kanoha slaughtered them in retribution for killing your master and his followers, Daiki replied. That was the way of things back then. We killed them until the last man and made sure none could ever come back with thoughts of revenge, 
we took everything of value and burned their village to the ground. They're all gone. It was a bit sobering, actually, to bring it up. It reminded him of how truly brutal this world was. And he wasn't some messiah like Naruto who could make people repent and see the light and find better ways of living. He was just your everyday shinobi, with a bit more information than the rest to use to his advantage. He didn't have the privilege of strength or inborn power or talent to worry about people like that. I see. Shiromori replied simply. Just then, a massive puff of smoke enveloped the castle, and it was suddenly just gone. All that remained being the stone base it was built atop, and in its place was a titanic dark green scaled chameleon, with bright yellow eyes, long serpent-like feelers reminiscent of ears stretching back from its skull, and a pair of wing-like appendages jutting out from its back, and its gargantuan tail was topped with the head of a huge serpent. What the hell? Daiki gaped at Shiromori's true form. For one, why the hell did he have a snake as a tail? And secondly, he recognized him. Sure, he was much darker in color, but this was the chameleon summon of pains, right? Does that mean pain killed and enslaved Shiromori sometime before the end of the time skip? Daiki's thoughts raced. Bright yellow eyes stared down at him, examining him. What's with the snake head tail? He couldn't stop himself from asking. Shiromori blinked slowly. It is merely a sign of my parentage? The huge chameleon replied. He was quite forthcoming. The chameleon clan were once allied with the snake clan, an experiment on the path to becoming the dragon clan as they so desire. I was born to the previous leader of the chameleon clan and the current leader of the snake clan, Manda. The one to explain the second part of that was the snake head itself, raising up over Shiromori's normal head to look down at Daiki. It seemed that Shiromori had a single personality controlling both heads. So, was it maybe a shared perception kind of thing then? Kind of like what Nagat did with his six paths of pain and the Rinnegan? But still, that explained so much about the looks of Shiromori. Kind of. It even explained that the wing-like appendages and feelers that if they were hardened, could pass for horns. They were dragon-like. Just like how those who mastered Snake Sage Mode, would transcend being a snake to become a dragon and gain dragon-like appendages, like horns in Kabuto's case. Kanoha is kind of against the snake clan for the most part right now. Daiki settled on replying with, despite how many questions he wanted to ask. Their main summoner is a traitor of Kanoha who fled the village. There is no issue with that. The alliance with the snake clan has long since fallen through. Shiromori's huge shoulders gave something akin to an uncaring shrug. And there is no love lost between my father and I, he is a vile, arrogant beast. Fair enough, Daiki shrugged. So, is there any form of test you have for me? You know, to get your allegiance and all and your cooperation? No, Shiromori replied. I and the clan will observe you, that is all. Should we find you to be unfitting as a summoner, we will simply score your name out from the main summoning scroll and bar you from summoning us. As it is, you may call upon me and my clan as you wish, for now. Though... It will be a long while before you are capable of summoning myself. You lack the chakra needed. Ha, huh, he'd have to look for out for that in the future and keep up good relations with them. But other than that, there was nothing to complain about there. Wait! He paused, a thought coming to mind. You can sense my chakra? Daiki asked. Of course I can. Shiromori rolled his huge bright yellow eyes. The chameleon clan specialize in blending in, hiding from others and sensing others, Every member of the Chameleon Clan is a born censor. Well, good for them, he supposed. He was not at all jealous. Besides, now he could basically summon a censor to help him out whenever he needed. So good for him. Cool. You guys are pretty amazing, huh? Daiki praised. Well, my name is Daiki. Pleasure to be working with you. Yes, I suppose it is. Shiromori nodded once. It is time for me to return home now, though. So until we next meet, Summoner Daiki. The huge chameleon dipped his main head respectfully, before disappearing in a huge puff of smoke, returning to his home. Well, that was a thing. Daiki chewed his lip. Way, way easier than he thought it was going to go. And now he had his own personal summons go to him. Though, as usual, he'd need to work on his chakra capacity before he could actually do anything on that front. At least he already knew the hand seals for the summoning jutsu and it was a pretty straightforward technique. Time to go home, Daiki told himself. 
He brought out the sealing scroll from his pouch and sealed the summoning contract scroll within it and hopped up into the trees surrounding the area. He paused as he landed, his eyes for a moment drifting in the direction of the Land of Rivers. Tanagakir wasn't the only place in the Land of Rivers after all. There was an Akatsuki base there. But even more importantly for him was the Katabami Gold Mine, a small mining town in the Land of Rivers, and not all that far from his current position. And the place where Raiga and Ranmaru had taken up residence. Soon, he promised himself, it wasn't time yet. He didn't have the strength to take down Raiga as he was right now. But he would. He knew exactly where to find the man. The only thing he was missing was the strength he needed to do so. Daiki found himself arriving back within the Leaf Village in the early morning. He could have been back earlier, but decided to make camp and rest for a few hours before he did. And make a copy of both the instructions of the Electromagnetic Murder Ninjutsu and the Seal Matrix of the Chameleon Clan Summoning Scroll. Something interesting he'd learned about seals was that for the most part, one could not actually activate the seal matrix without understanding how the seal worked and triggering the effects with chakra. Only the very basic of basic seals could be triggered by one who didn't understand how they worked, because the trigger was just that simple and could be activated just by running chakra through it. It was a bit of a bummer to learn really at first, because it meant he couldn't just get Naruto shirtless and copy his 8 trigram seal and bam, plop it on himself and find him a bijou or something to stuff in there and them gains. Then again, it made sense, kind of. If one could just copy and use a seal, the Horatian wouldn't be so rare, now would it? Anyway, copying down the matrix of the summoning contract scroll at least allowed him to study a high-level and rare type of seal matrix and expand his own knowledge. He only understood a fraction of it when he was copying out down, but already, Daiki's head was filled with ideas. Perhaps I can etch a seal onto weapons and other items and connect the seal to a storage seal, a weaker version of the summoning seal to have them return to the storage seal after a set period of time. The boy mused as he made his way through the village towards the Hokage Tower. He didn't exactly have legendary weapons on hand, but launching tons of weapons from a seal may as well be a jutsu in of its own make. He could make his very own bootleg Gate of Babylon. Gate of Shining. Now that was a sweet and totally original name. His name meant Shining after all, or maybe Shining Gate would be better. Granted, there were kinks that needed to be ironed out. A scroll wasn't exactly the best use of that. Perhaps if he tattooed the seal on his palm? He could even possibly edit the sealing matrix to add part of the force from the explosive seal, to have the option to basically point and shoot his weapons from it instead of having to throw them like Tenten. Further study and experimentation was definitely required on that front. Either way, he copied them down simply because he wasn't sure or not if he would be allowed to keep them. Summoning scrolls were incredibly rare after all, and electromagnetic murder was a B-rank jutsu, probably worth a pretty penny for sure. Well anyway, he had the copies and his name was already on the contract scroll, so even if they were confiscated, he wouldn't really be losing out on much. It was also a test. To see how much he could get away with. Would the Hokage take his loot from him? Seeing as it was Haruzen, while the possibility was always there, he doubted it. But, the pragmatic thing to do was cover his bases and test it regardless. A few minutes later, Daiki arrived at his destination and put those thoughts out of his mind for the moment. The genin made his way into the Hokage Tower and through the bottom floor of the building to the mission admission room. It seemed it was early enough in the day, that once again the Hokage was in the room which saved time the second he unveiled the summoning scroll, he'd probably have got directed to his office anyway. Ah, uh, Daiki Kuin back already? The Sandame greeted him warmly. Yes, sir. He stopped in front of the main desk that the Hokage was sat behind and bowed his head respectfully. It wasn't far to travel and the bandits were easy pickings, they didn't even notice at all. Splendid work, Saratobi praised him, puffing lightly on the pipe hanging from between his lips. I'll be sure to let the client know, so you can collect your payment. Thank you, but before that, Daiki began. Hmm. The elderly Hokage raised an eyebrow at him. There were a few hiccups that the mission details did not account for. He added, Is that so? The Hokage hummed, eyeing him with interest. What kind of hiccups? The bandits were lead by a missing mean, Daiki revealed reaching into his tool pouch and pulling out the bingo book within and flipping to a specific, dog-eared page. 
Kamaya Gakazu, a former genin of Kumo. I see, that would indeed boost the ranking of a mission, and I would not send a rookie such as yourself to deal with a missing ninja, especially not alone. Sarutobi leaned forward lightly and read over the entry within the book before looking the boy in the eyes. I take though, since you are standing here reporting the success of your mission, he has been taken care of? His sensing abilities were poor. I plastered the hut he was taking residence in with multiple explosive tags. He didn't survive, Daiki explained promptly. I admit, I was expecting more from him. I dare say it's a good thing there wasn't more to him or you may not be standing here now. The old man shook his head lightly. You should have returned when you noticed the change in mission parameters. The scolding was light. Daiki winced lightly, but he'd already prepared his cover story. I would have, but while spying on them, he revealed a piece of information that prompted me to act. Indeed, Sarutobi mused in return, prompting him to continue. He was in possession of a ninjutsu scroll for a B-rank lightning jutsu, but not only that, Daiki continued. He spoke of a summoning contract scroll that he had discovered hidden in a castle not far away from the outpost he and the bandits had taken over. The Hokage blinked. That was the only action of surprise he gave. Truly? He asked. Daiki nodded. I decided to take care of him then and there, then secure the contract scroll myself. He revealed. Beruzan sighed and lifted his hand up to rub the bridge of his nose. And again, seeing as you are standing here now, I'm sure you were successful, he replied, before shaking his head and lowering his arm. In future, do not take risks such as this lightly. Your life as a shinobi of Kanoha has far more worth than a mere B-rank jutsu or summoning scroll. Daiki blinked in return. Ah, he was surprised. He was just a run-of-the-mill nobody genin after all. A B-rank jutsu, never mind a summoning scroll, was worth far more in the grand scheme of things than some career genin dropout scrub. At least, that was what he was as far as the village knew. If you want, I can pass them over to you now. Daiki put those thoughts out of mind for the moment once more and carried on. No, it's fine my boy. His leader waved him off. You found them, so they are yours to do with as you please. Wait what? Daiki gaped at the man, while he merely tapped his finger lightly to his chin. I admit that I am curious as to what summon clan the contract is for. The Sandame hummed in thought. The Chameleon Clan, Daiki answered on reflex. The castle itself turned out to have been the boss summon of the clan in disguise. He had been there for fifty years after his last summoner dash, Koza. Sartobi finished his sentence for him. I see, now it's beginning to make sense. We have long wondered what became of the Chameleon Clan and the boss Shiromari in particular. They have not been active for fifty years now. Not since Koza and his men were killed by Tanagakir. Wow, he caught on really fast. What a smart old son of a gun. Yes, Daiki nodded in confirmation. It seems the only reason Shiromari approved of me is because I'm a Kanoha shinobi and mentioned that we wiped out Tanagakir in retribution for what they did in the land of Nex. Ah, it's been a long time since I thought of Kozakuin and Shiromari. Quite the pair they were. The old man sighed, before chuckling fondly. Did you know one of my students even based a jutsu on the chameleon clan's abilities when I told him of them? Jiraiya-sama? Daiki hedged. In response, Sarutobi snorted in amusement. His perverted reputation has even reached the new generation. I'm sure he'd be proud. He chortled lightly before shaking his head. When you are able to summon Shiromari, but sure to let me know. I'd love to catch up with that old lizard. I'll get right on that. Daiki agreed finding the tension that had appeared in his shoulders as he approached the room beginning to ease away. Are you sure it's okay to leave a summoning contract like this with me? A weak nobody? Yes. The Hokage answered immediately and stared Daiki in the eyes. Let me be clear though, you're hardly weak. Weaker than many other yes, but weak itself? No. You may think lesser of yourself for not gaining a Jonin Sensei, but I'm well aware of the abilities of your graduating class. You were easily within the top ten of your class and you seem to have grown staggeringly fast since then. You think so? Daiki couldn't help but ask reflexively. Your accomplishments so far speak for themselves and you are young, so very young. I can easily see you becoming a jonin by time you are twenty. The old man praised him. Talent is not the be-all and end-all, drive is far more important and within you I can sense a deep burning flame. That summoning scroll will merely help you on that path. And again... I must add, 
You were the one that found it. It is yours. Do not let anyone else tell you otherwise. Daiki felt his throat close up with emotion a bit, gratitude filling him at the old man's words. Yes, was all he managed to utter out. Haruzan coughed lightly. Now, about your mission reward. The old man changed the subject. Did you perhaps bring proof of this Kumo ninja's death at your hands? His figurative pockets were stocked full. Figurative, because in general it really wasn't a mind-blowing amount. But, a 94,000 Rio payout from the mission all to himself since he did it alone, plus the 150,000 Rio bounty he collected, on top of the Rio he looted from the bandits after killing them, he was back to over 300,000 Rio again. Specifically, 338,000 in total. Just from one mission. Before it had taken him some if his leftover savings from his orphan stipend, a bunch of D-ranks and one C-rank to get around this much. Truly, there was a spring in Daiki's step as he left the bright red Hokage Tower behind and headed home. He was incredibly pleased with his earnings, and he felt in general quite happy. Especially since while Hiruzen was Hokage, he didn't need to worry about turning over his loot and could keep it in the future. As long as Hiruzen was Hokage. He paused in the middle of the busy Kanoha Street, a pit forming in his stomach. He's going to die in less than five months. Daiki grimaced at the thought, and was surprised at how angry that made him feel suddenly. Say what you will about some of the man's more questionable choices, but even with the few times he'd interacted with the Hokage, he'd always treated Daiki well, better than well even going by his latest meeting. And the old man had instilled a new confidence in him. But, grating as it was, there's nothing I can do for him. He clenched his fists tight, before hopping up onto the roof of a shop and roof hopping his way back to his apartment. To do anything for the man would involve showing off knowledge of things he could not know. And he would definitely get interrogated then. Hiruzen would definitely let him live despite all the knowledge he'd gained, probably. But, the likes of Danzo? He would find out what knowledge Daiki possessed one way or another, and then he'd be killed for knowing about the truth of things, such as the Uchiha massacre. For now, I just need to focus on getting stronger. Daiki smacked his cheeks to make himself focus. He arrived in his apartment not long later, threw on his weights and made a beeline straight for training ground 69. Thankfully, he had a lot to focus on training-wise right now, and enough money that he could focus on his training without having to worry about that factor in his life for the next at least month, maybe two. You know what? The ceiling arts were freaking amazing. The more Daiki understood, the less he seemed to know about it. But at the same time, made him realize just how it made the Uzumaki clan so freaking damn feared, enough to make three of the big five shinobi villages team up to take them down. The best he could describe it as was suddenly learning the basics of mathematics again, and finding the world opening up, his mind understanding things in a completely, almost foreign, yet natural way. Like two plus two was four, and two times two was also four. Yet 2 plus 3 equaled 5, but 2 times 3 came to 6. It was like a code to a part of reality. Mind blown. And with a little bit of ingenuity and creativity, one could accomplish so much. Right, that's the then kid. The tattoo artist who had just finished up his second palm said, In total for both, that'll be 20,000 Rio. Ish quite pricey, but worth it. Daiki's eyes glanced down to his palms, where the matrix of a seal spread out across his palms, and then then spiraled out between his fingers and up to crisscross around his wrists, reminiscent almost of a pair of spiderwebs. The ink itself he had provided for the tattoos. Sealing ink mixed with his own blood, making the seal cost less chakra to activate as long as it was from his chakra. Though, you'll need to be careful you won't be able to use your hands much, and you'll need to clean the wounds out quite often for the next few days. The tattoo artist added, Nah, it's fine. Daiki waved him off. Gingerly, gently, he brought his hands together and ran through two easy seals. Mystical palm jutsu. He intoned, green light flaring around his hands. Conveniently, the green aura of the jutsu covered up to his wrists quite well, and so he could seal the small needle wounds in a matter of seconds. Ah, right ninja crap. The man glanced at his forehead where his headband was located. Useful stuff. Damn right. Daiki grinned at him. Before reaching into his pocket and grabbing his wallet, counting out the price given in notes. Here you go. 
Thanks a bunch. Eh? No problem, kid. Pretty cool tattoo. Was fun to work on even. The man shrugged. Feel free to look me up again if you want others like it. I'll be sure to do that. Daiki replied. Before bidding the man goodbye and leaving the tattoo parlor behind. He'd switched up his weights for a heavier pair now, since they were getting easy to move in, to the point where he barely noticed them now. Thankfully, the guy who sold them the originals let him trade them in and only pay the extra for the others, so he only had to fork out in 50,000 Rio for them. He doubled his weight per limb. So now he had 1,200 pounds per limb, for a total of 4,800 pounds in total. He was almost at half what Rock Lee wore on a single leg now. On top of that, while he was in the shopping distract, he'd taken care of what he just did. Hitting up the tattoo parlor to have the matrix for his newly created ceiling matrix tattooed into his palms. It was a pretty simple seal to be honest, only a minor tweak. He'd taken part of the explosive seal and added it to the storage seal. Specifically, he'd taken a part that added concussive force to the explosive seal. Doing so, would allow him to add pure force with a quick flare of chakra to anything he unsealed just by trigger that lone part of the seal specifically. Honestly, the hard part of it was jury rigging the trigger of the storage seal part to not go off at the mere feeling of chakra running through it. Basically, he had to edit it to change up the trigger for it. Which meant he could also use the concussive force part of the seal alone if he so desired. Itching to try it out, Daiki hopped up onto the roofs of a building quickly, before thrusting his palm out and running chakra through the seal in a very specific way. The air shook and rippled massively as a corona of force shot through it. Whoa! Daiki yelped a bit, spinning around and almost landing on his ass. The kickback behind it was enough to force his entire arm back and spin his whole body. I'll need to get stronger to use this properly. He laughed lightly. But hey, he already had a name for this jutsu he'd just created with the seal. Force Palm Jutsu. Totally original, not stolen from anywhere, honest. Force Palm Jutsu used through the Dimension Force Seal. Yeah, that's a great name. Daiki nodded to himself proudly. It rolled off the tongue and sounded cool. Now, he just needed to head home and transfer all the weapons he'd painstakingly inscribed with another of his original seals, he'd be good to go. Really, he didn't know if anybody had done it before, but he put his thoughts weeks ago after returning from that C-rank mission to work, and lifted part of the summoning seal from the contract scroll and the link used to link that summoning mechanic to the chameleons, and added it to his weapons. Granted, a much more simplified version, nowhere near as highly complex as the full one within the scroll. But really, for a dude that had only been learning sealing for about two months now, he thought it was some pretty damn good progress. Heck, his status screen even agreed with him. Name? Daiki Yurii. Age? 13. Chakra Capacity? 12. 440-12. 440. Chunin. Strength? 53.5 to 500. Endurance? 80.4 to 500. Durability? 53.5 to 500 Agility 53.5 out of 500 Taijutsu 112 slash 500 Ninjutsu 102 out of 500 Jinjutsu 10 slash 500 Bukijutsu 18.7 slash 500 Chakra Control 168 slash 500 Chakra Affinities Lightning Novice you have learned, but the basics of harnessing the power of lightning. Few in Jutsu. Adept you are no longer a mere amateur. And that was with all the training he was still doing. His chakra capacity had finally reached Chunin status once it broke 10,000. God, he could only imagine how monstrously large Kagatir chakra reserves had to be. Still, look at those numbers. They were absolutely amazing. Ninjutsu had broken a hundred and Taijutsu was steadily, if ever so slowly, increasing. And Mystical Palm Jutsu was so damn useful during training, letting him training physically for much longer because he recovered way quicker when using it. Now, if only the good news continued from there. As he continued on his way to his apartment, Daiki lifted his hand and focused, static sparked around his finger, small, pale blue bolts of electricity crackling into existence. Yet, it was all appearance. It only looked like lightning wasn't actual lightning. And he'd been at a complete dead end even getting to this point over the past 20 days, 
only managed this after he finally got the electromagnetic murder jutsu down. Maybe if I learn more lightning jutsu, it'll become easier. He mused. The only other idea he had was copying Naruto's training a bit. Naruto had the basics more or less down when he cut the leaf with pure wind chakra during his training, basically exactly what happened to the chakra paper he used to test his affinity. Daiki could try doing the same with leaves until he made them crinkle. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'll do. He fist pumped, speeding up along the way to his apartment. The next morning, Daiki found himself once again on the track back to training ground 69. Honestly, it may as well have become his home away from home, considering he seemed to be spending the better part of his day there, more than half really. His life consisted of the grind only these days. At least he had a few books to take the edge of when he was bored. Freaking Jiraiya man, he was a genius, the first installment of Aika Aika, was literary masterpiece. A story following the childhood and eventual early adulthood and adventures of the main character Winareya and busted big titted heroine Hotnade. Both new to love, begin dating, and their eyes gradually opening to grown-up love. It was a beautiful story indeed. It brought a tear to the eye. From sheer freaking laughter at the size of the man's balls. Even as he focused his thoughts on his training, he couldn't stop the soft chuckle that escaped his lips. I'm. Heh. Definitely on to something though. Freaking Jiraiya man. He's such a legend. Truly a role model worth following in the footsteps of. But yeah, he tried out the leaf training yesterday and he'd only managed to crinkle the tip of the leaf. Once he could maintain a current of lightning chakra that could crinkle the entire thing, he bet he would have improved by leaps and bounds. I should probably see about trying out the shadow clone jutsu, it will make my training go much faster. He mused. He knew the hand seals for it. How could he not? With how much Naruto spammed it, and the formation of a clone was something he'd learned years ago. He'd been holding off trying it out until he had chakra in the Chunin range, and an excuse for him knowing it. I can't believe he's this late after we just got back. A familiar, loud voice echoed. Speak of the devil. Or in this case, a walking, talking excuse. Daiki paused on the path between the training grounds, just outside the entrance to training ground 7 and peered inside. And there they were. Pink, blonde and raven-haired. Sasuke was sitting at the base of a tree, arms clasped and brooding looking as always, while Sakura seemed to be trying to sit as close as possible to him, without leaning into his lap and Naruto was standing up, kicking rocks to vent his frustration, apparently about their sensei being late as usual. Technically speaking, he didn't even really need to speak to them or anything like that. He could just hang around a bit to see Naruto use his jutsu and say he copied it, a good enough excuse. But, this was a good opportunity to really test himself, seeing as that missing Nin was a disappointment who died without ever putting up a fight. Daiki's eyes settled briefly on Sasuke. There was roughly two months and a half until the Chunin exams. He could see how well he stacked up to Sasuke to see how well he would in the exams. After all, outside the likes of Lee, Niji and such, Sasuke was one of the strongest genin that would be competing in the exam. Yo, Naruto! Decision made. Daiki walked into the training ground tossing a wave in their direction as he greeted the loud blonde. Still as loud as always, huh? Three pairs of eyes swiveled around to him, blue eyes blinking for a minute. Hey, you. Naruto trailed off. Who are you again? Daiki stopped cold in his tracks and gaped. You don't remember me? His mouth opened and closed like a fish, floundering for something else to say. This, this he was not expecting. He caught sight of a small smirk on Sasuke's face, before the Uchiha looked away when Daiki caught his eyes. Prick. You're such an idiot, Naruto? Sakura sighed, rolling her eyes and shaking her head. It's Daiki, remember? He was in the same class as us for eight years. Naruto blinked olishly. Nope. Doesn't ring a bell? The orange-clad blonde shrugged. Sorry, I guess? I want to punch him. Daiki's eye twitched briefly. A fist was deposited into the back of Naruto's head and he yelped, face planting into the dirt. Can you be any more ignorant, you moron? Sakura huffed, then looked at him. So what brings you here, Daiki? How are Suzuki and Ami? The pink-haired girl grimaced a bit as she said the second name. Ami and Suzuki? Who the hell were? Oh right, my teammates for all of a day. Daiki remembered. 
I just heard Naruto as I was passing by, thought I'd check in and see how you guys are doing. He replied, at least someone pleasant. Even if it was Sakura. As for those two, don't know we failed our team exam. I don't know what they did. But I joined the Genin Corps instead of heading back to the academy for another year. Sakura's lips twitched up into a smile. Ami failed her? Her smile turned vicious. Serves her right. She pumped her fist into the air happily. Before suddenly realizing what she was cheering about. Oh, sorry. The pink-haired girl apologized sheepishly. Daiki snorted. It's fine. She wasn't exactly much help during our exam anyway. He waved her from, and he was telling the truth. Neither was Suzuki for that matter. We had to land a hit on our Jonin sensei like a full-on hit, not anything blocked or anything. They gave up half an hour in, and I just wasn't good enough to land a hit on a Jonin. He remembered being so angry about how useless they were at the time. On that front, he could definitely understand that Prick Genma not giving them any other chances, even if Daiki managed to allow them to pass, he'd have to take on those two slackers as well. Sakura winced. Yeah, after seeing what our Jonin sensei can do. I sympathize. She nodded. In fact, I don't dash before she could say anything else. A snort came from Sasuke, and he cut her off. Don't go making excuses for him, Sakura. He failed because he was too weak. That's it. The Uchiha input, still looking away from him. Well, I mean... Sakura looked at him before to Sasuke, and he could practically see the cogs in her head turning. She wanted to agree with Sasuke, but realized how much of a biatch she would sound. You're not wrong, Daiki shrugged and agreed. Not that you'd have been any different Uchiha. Oh, Naruto chuckled lightly, blue eyes glinting eagerly. Looks like he has you pegged bastard, at the slight against his abilities. Sasuke jumped to his feet and turned around, Big words coming from a dropout loser. Eh, Sasuke Kuen, shouldn't we calm down a bit? Sakura tried to placate him, but as usual, he ignored her, his eyes flashing red as his Sharingan flared to life, two Tomo in one, and a single in the other. They've already been to wave then, he realized. You might have been hot crap in the Academy Uchiha with all the teachers wanting to suck up your scrawny ass, but in the real world, you're nothing special. Daiki fired back. Of course he knew how special this jerk really was, but the easiest way to get to Sasuke Uchiha was to trample over his pride, well, beyond pulling the Itachi card. Sasuke snorted. Real world? Let me tell you, unlike some sad loser like you who's probably stuck doing those crappy deranks every day without a proper sensei to teach you, he began. We've already been to another country on a real mission and fought against enemy shinobi. Daiki crossed his arms and snorted right back. Am I supposed to be impressed? whoop dee doo you went out on a C-rank with two teammates and a Jonin backing you up. He fired. For your information, I've been out of the village as well in other countries and I've fought enemy shinobi in both. Unlike you though, I did it alone, and personally killed and claimed the bounty on the missing Nin I fought, alongside his little army of bandits. Eh? Naruto uttered in surprise. Wait, you can do mission solo? That's not fair. Why can't I do that? You have? That's impressive. Sakura praised him, and Daiki felt his chest puff out a bit. Say what you will about Sakura Haruno and how annoying she could be fawning over the Uchiha. But one couldn't deny, she was good looking. Creamy skin, pretty face, lovely eyes, exotic long pink hair, and while lacking in the chest department, she had some nice legs and perky, round ass. And a pretty girl praising you was a pretty girl praising you, end of story. Sasuke's eye twitched, before visibly composed himself and smirked. Yeah, probably some weakling bottom feeder. We on the other hand fought a member of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, he retorted. But, if you still think you stand anywhere close to my level, I'll be happy to fight you here and now and prove how far above you I am. A member of the seven ninja swordsmen, huh? That is impressive. Daiki nodded of your sensei, cause I bet you hid behind him like a little girl and trembled the second the enemy unleashed their killing intent on you. Ajov niggas. Was it fair that he was using his meta-knowledge to insult him? Even if it was Daiki didn't care. Honestly, I don't see why I should waste my time with fighting a weakling like you who needs their sensei to carry them. He pushed on, before smirking as an idea came to mind. Though, let's make it interesting and I'll think about it. The loser has to teach the winner a jutsu, 
I always did like that fireball jutsu of yours. Sasuke visibly trembled, the Tomo in his crimson red Sharingan eyes spinning in anger. Fine with me. He grit out. He didn't even bother asking what kind of jutsu Daiki had, letting his anger and pride rule him. What an idiot. Let's get some space. Then do this then. Daiki grinned, beckoning the older boy to follow him over away from Naruto and Sakura. On the way, running his palms over his weights and sealing them away. Sasuke Kuin Daiki, you guys really shouldn't be F Sakura began. Only for Sasuke to cut her off again. Stay out of this, he bit out. Oi! Don't go getting pissed at Sakura-chan just because your angry Daisuke totally owned you bastard. Naruto growled at him. Daiki twitched in annoyance. He forgot my name again. He should have goaded them both so he could punch his damn whiskered face in. You know, he felt guilty before for sexualizing Naruto's hot, dead mother in his fantasies the few times she came to mind. Not so much anymore. Moments later, Daiki and Sasuke faced off against each other, stood 30 feet apart in the middle of the training ground. Another smirk spread across Sasuke's face as Daiki slid into the opening stance of the academy-style taijutsu. Daiki smirked right back. All right, let's keep this clean. Okay, guys, whoever can pin the other and keep them immobile wins. Sakura hesitantly addressed. Don't worry, Sakura. This won't take long. Sasuke assured her. Sharingan eyes locked onto his opponent. He's right, Daiki agreed. I'm about to go all Tobarama on his ass and make Kanoha great again. Who the hell is Tobarama? Naruto, arms crossed behind his head, squinted his eyes in confusion. Sakura gave him an odd look, but sighed and nodded. All right then, the pink-haired Kunoichi conceded. Begin, she announced. As soon as she said so, Sasuke exploded forward rushing towards Daiki at a blinding pace, covering the distance in mere moments. Daiki remained in placing, waiting for him to come. He's faster. He held off, clicking his tongue. Sasuke flicked his hand suddenly, and Shuriken appeared, free of them, blitzing through the tiny gap in the air between them. They were so sudden, Daiki didn't have time to think up a counter, leaving them to stab into his shoulders and the middle of his chest. He puffed into smoke, a log replacing his previous position with the three shuriken embedded into it. Hmph! Sasuke whipped his foot back, bleeding off his momentum and spinning backwards a half a foot, just in time to avoid a rising knee strike aimed at his kidneys. Daiki's back to him now. Sasuke completed his spin and launched a roundhouse straight up at the other genin's side. Daiki's muscular arm whipped out, blocking the kick with his forearm. Sasuke smirked, using the force of his own kick and the block, to force himself up into the air and windmill into another kick that Daiki wasn't able to block this time. Sasuke's sandal connected with Daiki's cheek with an audible impact and launched him backwards, even lifting him briefly up of his feet a bit, before he slammed his feet into the ground and bled off the force. You said you liked my jutsu, huh? Sasuke's smirk stretched as he ran through a series of hand seals blindingly fast, before cupping his hand around his mouth. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. He exhaled powerfully, launching a huge fireball, the size of a grown man towards Daiki. Clicking his tongue for real this time, Daiki thrust out one of his palms, unleashing his force palm jutsu. Sasuke's eyes widened as his fireball was blown completely apart before it even reached halfway towards his opponent and quickly crossed his arms over his chest, before jumping back. Wind style? The Uchiha gasped. The corona of pure wind force slammed into him and carried him further through the air. His arms ached, but due to his quick thinking, a lot of the force from the attack was already bled off and he took little real damage from it. Daiki gave him no reprieve. Running through a few hand seals, he exploded forward with a shun shin. Sasuke was able to track him though and jerked his head to the side just in time to avoid a heavy straight punch that crashed straight through the bark of a thick tree behind him. Lashing out with a rapid punch, Sasuke caught Daiki in the side, making him grunt in pain, then ducked as the other boy pulled his hand out of the tree, unleashing a spinning backhand, then ducked backwards avoiding the follow-up knee strike he saw coming in slow motion. Hands touching the ground as he bent backwards, Sasuke launched into a handstand snap kick directed at Daiki's lower jaw, 
but Daiki caught the kick with his palm, stopping it in its tracks. Sasuke was fine with that, using it as a feint to spin like a spinning top and lash out with his other leg at Daiki's unguarded face. Once again a blue sandal met Daiki's face, this time, much harder than before, and pain exploded in his cheek as he was bodily lifted into the air. His palm tightened over Sasuke's other foot, though, and the Uchiha grunted as Daiki dragged him up into the air with him. Then his eyes went wide when Daiki thrust out his other hand and unleashed a corona of pure force while beginning to spin. Sasuke got a real first-hand view of what it was like to be a spinning top, his vision blurring even with the Sharingan active as Daiki whipped them around and slammed him hard into the ground below as their airtime came to an end. The breath was knocked out of Sasuke as his back met the ground and cratered it inwards, but he didn't have much time to counter. Daiki hadn't let go of his foot even after slamming him down into the dirt, and bodily hauled the pale-skinned boy up out of the small crater his back had made in it. Sasuke didn't bother trying to escape Daiki's grip, instead, lashing out with his free leg again to kick him under the junction of his arm, right in the armpit while at the same time running through a few hand seals. Gah! Daiki grimaced, forced to let go of his fellow Jenin before he could slam him again, and his eyes widened as he noticed the boy, as he fell below him. His hands were in the tiger seal, and he was taking a deep breath. Time slowed down for Daiki, and resumed just as quickly, a snarl leaving his lips and baring his teeth. The tan-skinned boy thrust out his palm, catching Sasuke in the lower stomach. Force palm jutsu, he roared, triggering the seal on his palm. The good thing about his little seal was that it could be activated pretty much instantly. Sasuke gagged as once more a corona of pure force erupted from Daiki's palm, this time at point-blank range. He was sent soaring back through the air, flipping ass overhead multiple times, before slamming into the ground thirty feet away. Sasuke-kun? Sakura's scream of worry rang in Daiki's ears, but it felt muted, as if she was miles away. All of his attention was focused on the older boy laying first down in the dirt. If this were an enemy, he wouldn't even give them a chance to get up. This would be the perfect chance to use his one and only lightning-style ninjutsu and finish him off. But this was just a spar in the end to test himself. It took a good decent little before, before Sasuke's arms twitched, and he slowly forced himself onto his hands and knees and struggled to his feet from there, despite the damage he'd taken. So much so his legs shook. He was panting deeply and clutching his lower stomach, yet his eyes were locked solidly on Daiki, determination burning in his crimson-red orbs. With his other hand, he reached for his shinobi pouch, but just before he could, a hand grasped him by the shoulder. Daiki blinked. Suddenly, with no warning whatsoever, an older, vest-wearing shinobi with gravity-defying white hair stood behind Sasuke. I think that's enough for a mere spar, Sasuke. Don't you? Kakashi Hitaki hummed his eyes not even looking at Sasuke and, instead, on the book he was holding in his other hand, idly reading from it. Holy crap! Daiki gaped. He hadn't even seen a thing. No a displacement of air. Not a shadow, not a blur. Nothing. One moment he wasn't there, the next he just... was... Kakashi. Don't get in my way. Sasuke spat, glaring over his shoulder at his sensei. I can take him! Maybe... Kakashi shrugged. But if he wanted to, he could have broken your leg the second he got his hand on your foot. As far as the spar goes, he wins. Just accept it. Sasuke glared him for a moment, before realization seemed to ping through him. That wind jutsu. He trailed off, before whipping around to look at Daiki. You didn't use any hand seals and used it so quickly. Exactly. Kakashi nodded once. Keich. Sasuke grunted spitting to the side, before nodding tersely. Fine. It's my loss. Won't happen again though now that I know your little trick. If you say so. Daiki shrugged, he doubted it though, considering how little practice he'd had with it and couldn't even use it properly right now. His arms were freaking killing him from the kickback of it. He did learn something interesting from this though. It could augment his taijutsu quite nicely. Sudden explosive on the spot momentum, for enhancing attacks or changing directions or even trajectories of his attacks. And best of all was how little chakra it used. 
Just don't forget you owe me a jutsu now. He pointed out. Yeah, yeah. Sasuke huffed. I'll write down the instructions and get them to you by tomorrow. I'm not hanging around to teach you it personally. Fine with me. Daiki rolled his eyes. You'll be able to find me in training ground 69 for the most part when you do. Whatever. Sasuke shrugged, jerking his shoulder out of Kakashi's grip and making his way over to a nearby tree to sit down and frown. Brooding thoughtfully, Sasuke Kuin, are you okay? Sakura's attention was full on Sasuke now. Rushing over to him, she barely even glanced at Daiki. Ouch. Heh. Looks like you beat the bastard. Naruto sniggered, making his way over. Don't think it means you can beat me though. I've already totally saw through all your moves. Your jutsu is cool, but mine is way better. Doubt it? Daiki snorted, crossing his arms. Do you even know any jutsu beyond the academy ones? You've always had a habit of bragging about crap you can't back up. The goading was intentional. Naruto growled. I sure can back it up. Check this out. And like a moth to a flame, the blonde Jinchuriki fell for it hook, line and sinker. Shadow clone jutsu, he called out, crossing his fingers together. There was a puff of smoke at his side, and another Naruto appeared, grinning cockily just like the original. Heh. Well, what do you think of this? A physical clone jutsu? Daiki made a show of raising his eyebrow. Neat. He shrugged. Naruto staggered back as if struck. Neat. That's it? He whispered to himself, almost distraught. Daiki blinked. What? He was totally confused. Well, you sure put the boots to my team, huh kid? Kakashi's voice floated into his ears, and Daiki looked over his shoulder to find the man suddenly within arm's reach, without ever having made a sound. Crap, he really had a massive way to go, didn't he? Wasn't that hard? He calmed his racing heart and replied flippantly. I could have ended that at any time with my force palm jutsu. You could have indeed, Kakashi nodded in agreement. Though, bit of advice kid, don't get too cocky, that spar was brief, but it was blatant that Sasuke was quite a bit faster than you, and more skilled in taijutsu. Faster. Sure. More skilled. Debatable. Daiki replied. He had an easier time countering me because of his bloodline. I'd like to see how well he'd react to my taijutsu without them. Maybe bring that up when he challenges you to another spar to make up for this loss? Kakashi suggested with a shrug. Oh, so he knew Sasuke well enough already to know he'd be seeking Daiki out. Wipe that loss off the board? Daiki was already expecting it. He knew what Sasuke was all about, and his driving force. Well, next time, maybe you can pay his loss for him. Daiki laughed. Fire Jutsu is nice, but I'd prefer much lightning, since it's my affinity, or even a water Jutsu to use in tandem with my lightning Jutsu. You're bound to have a few extra of those kicking around, right? Hmm. Who knows? Kakashi mused. Though you seem to be well informed, my students had no idea who I was until our last mission. No. It's kind of obvious you're pretty high profile in the bingo book, Daiki deadpanned. Literally, any shinobi could request a bingo book. Kakashi was one of the first mentions in the Kanoha part of the book, with IWA specifically offering 200 million Rio for his head. It was kind of common sense to be clued in on the big names, wasn't it? They were the type of dudes you should know by face so you could run the other way the second you caught sight of them. Maybe, Kakashi shrugged again. Right, well, riveting as this conversation is, I've got training to do. Daiki bid the man goodbye and walked away. He could feel the man's gaze on his back as he vacated the training ground, and Sasuke was completely ignored Sakura fussing over him, his eyes holding Daiki's own until he dipped out of training ground 7 completely. Well, I think that was an absolute win for me. Daiki grinned. He had a rough idea of where he stood now, he got to test out his new jutsu in combat, he was getting a free jutsu out of murking Sasuke's ass and he had a full-on excuse from Naruto to go about learning the shadow clone jutsu. Winning, it's what I do. He sniggered proudly. The next morning, Daiki, as usual, found himself in training ground 69. After finishing through his initial workout and healing himself up with the mystical palm jutsu, getting them gains instantly, he got around to the next part of his training. Ninjutsu. Usually, for the last little while, he'd been working on his lightning chakra generation and manipulation. But he'd put that on hold yesterday, 
for a little bit, because he finally had the excuse he needed to work on a jutsu that would for sure make his training, at least in the learning sense of things, go much faster. Taking a deep breath and focusing, Daiki crossed his fingers in a familiar hand seal. It was a bit odd, it wasn't one of the normal 12 hand seals, at best it could pass for a modified ox seal. But, it did help him focus on the physical aspect of his chakra more. Which on of itself was interesting and made a lot of sense. Shadow clone jutsu, he declared. He felt chunk of his chakra be expended as he focused on the technique. But, not half. There was a puff of smoke and an identical copy of himself appeared at his side. Yet, there were glaring discrepancies. For example, his clone was pale and sweaty looking ill. You, you got the ratio wrong again. The clone said haggardly. I know. Daiki sighed and cancelled the technique. The clone disappeared in a chunk of smoke and he felt the chakra used to create it return to him. Or rather, about three quarters of it. He was beginning to see why this technique was a lesser form of a kenjutsu, a forbidden technique. Getting the ratio down was actually quite tough, on top of that, doing it wrong meant much of the chakra used would go to waste, leaving the clone formed wrong, and ensure the user got less chakra back upon the clone being dispelled. With that failure, he'd lost roughly a thirteenth of his total chakra capacity. Which might not seem like a lot, but it was when it only gave him so little chances to get the technique down before he had to rest and recover his chakra again. Still, that was a better attempt than the last few, before he'd given up last night and returned home to rest. And he was learning a lot through trial and error. For instance, he initially thought that clones would have the same chakra capacity as him, lower chakra to begin with, but more or less like a half-empty tank. Basically, like one could put their hand in, and feel space that wasn't filled with water or whatever. Maybe a bucket would have been a better analogy? Either way, that was not the case. The clone was a complete copy of him, right down to the chakra. The thing was though, the clone's tank, while a perfect copy for the most part, was a fraction of the size. Meaning, a shadow clone of him would never have the same max chakra output that he did. Especially since, his chakra coils would refill while the clones were still active. Hell, the clones could apparently regenerate chakra as well, just like him. Shadow clone jutsu was so freaking busted, without even getting into the memory transfer aspect of things. Bringing his hands together again, Daiki was about to attempt the jutsu once more, before he frowned and paused. He could feel someone coming. He might not be a sensor ninja, but his general senses weren't bad either. He looked over his shoulder, just as a familiar high-collared, dark-haired Uchiha made his way into the training ground. Sasuke eyed the training ground idly for a moment, before making his way over to Daiki. Your training ground is a chore to get to, he grunted. Exactly why I picked it. I don't have a family compound to train in so people don't disturb me, Daiki retorted, turning around to face the boy. Sasuke pursed his lips, before nodded. Sound logic? He replied. I imagine two idiots not bothering you constantly also helps with training. Wish I could say the same. You're not wrong, Daiki agreed. Honestly, as big a help a Jonin sensei would be to my training, having to have those two former teammates of mine along as well, would make my progress slower than it is now I'm sure. I'm better off really. Hell, not getting a Jonin sensei leading to his current situation was probably the best thing that ever happened to him. It's easy to see, with how much stronger you've gotten, Sasuke nodded. Wish I could say the same. Well, Naruto's not dead weight at least, unlike Ami and Suzuki were, they were pathetic. Daiki pointed out. Sasuke snorted. I notice you didn't mention Sakura not being dead weight. He responded. That was because he couldn't. Sakura had talent for sure but she didn't apply it and without Tsunade personally training her, she really had no right being on a team with Sasuke and Naruto. They were absolute monsters in the making without even taking into account Ashura and Indra. Well, she's good eye candy at least, he settled on replying with, hiding a wince. And she dropped to her knees for you at a word. I'm almost jealous. Sasuke raised an eyebrow at him, before scoffing, and have her think we're fated to be together forever or some other girlish fantasy nonsense? There was pure derision in his voice. No thank you. She already gets in the way of me getting stronger enough, I don't need her getting any other crazy ideas. You want to tap Sakura's arse? Feel free. Hell, I'll wish you luck. 
Maybe then she'll stop bothering me about this dating tripe. Well, wow. He knew Sasuke wasn't a fan of Sakura early on. But he didn't think he'd full-on express his more or less blessing for another dude to ram her just to keep her away from him. You know, you never expressed interest in any other girls at the academy. Daiki hummed. You realize you're gonna need to bang some girls to revive your clan, right? Women, not girls. Sasuke surprised him by correcting him promptly. Weak, useless deadweight. I have no interest in them being the mother of my children and the future matriarch of my clan. Besides, that goal is secondary and something that can be taken away at any moment unless I accomplish my main goal. Killing your brother? Daiki nodded in understanding. Yes, Sasuke hissed, his eyes on its eyes flashing red briefly. You're a lot smarter than my teammates, beyond Kakashi. Those other two have no idea what I'm after. Daiki shrugged. Naruto can't understand it. He'd try, but he won't be able to understand it because he hasn't experienced anything like that. He reasoned. And Sakura has deluded herself into believing she's in love with you when she knows Jack all about you. A brief chuckle left Sasuke. Funny. You sound like you do, though, he pointed out. A bit, he nodded in response. I'm an orphan, but I did know my parents for a little while, or at least my mother. My father was killed by the QB during its attack, and my mother was eaten away by its corrosive chakra for a few years before dying. I suppose you can understand a bit then, Sasuke agreed. Though, you at least have the solace of knowing the one who murdered your family is dead and gone now. Daiki chuckled. You'd think so, huh? He hummed, but said nothing else on the matter. It was funny, before he basically became a fusion of two people, he originally despised the QB, hating it for making him live life of an orphan. But, perspective really was key, and he found he couldn't hate Kurama. Not only was he mind-controlled into the attack, he'd been sealed away, for nearly an entire century, used and abused by humans, he couldn't blame the fox for attacking humans on sight and trying to kill them when the Sharingan hypnosis was broken. They lapsed into a silence that hung in the air. It was only broken by Sasuke giving a cough and reaching into his pocket, withdrawing a small scroll. Here, by the way, as we agreed on, the boy handed it over to him. I've written down all the instructions you'll need to learn the fireball jutsu. Oh, right, thanks. Daiki blinked, accepting it, before looking Sasuke in the eye. You're a lot more civil than you were yesterday. Sasuke smirked. You proved you were worth my time. He responded simply. You're strong. Daiki grinned proudly. And getting stronger and stronger every damn day. He agreed. Next time, I'll win. Sasuke vowed. We'll see. Daiki actually found he was quite eager for another spar with him. By the way, on the matter of Sakura... While I wouldn't mind a tumble with her, she's way too high maintenance for my liking, you can keep her. How generous of you, the dark-haired Uchiha replied, voice dry and rolling his eyes. Well, maybe pigs will learn to fly and I'll be able to foist her off on Naruto, along with that Yamanaka annoyance. Unlikely, but I can dream. Snorting, the Uchiha heir gave him a nod, bidding him goodbye, and walked away, leaving Daiki behind. He watched his fellow Jenin leave eyes fixated on his back. Huh, did I just become friends with that guy? He wondered. Yes, Daiki's voice echoed throughout training grounds 69 the very next day. It had taken a few days, quite a bit longer than Naruto to get it down. But he'd done it with only a fraction of the chakra the blonde Jinchuriki had at his disposal. How'd you feel? He asked the perfect clone of himself standing at his side. About the same, his clone shrugged. Beyond the chakra which is obvious, I don't feel any different. Daiki nodded. What about the system? He asked next. That's there too. His clone confirmed. Though the chakra capacity is reduced on mine. Interestingly, he couldn't see the system the clone could see. He tried showing the system off to a random civilian. And they couldn't see it either. In that way, it meant the system was somehow linked to his individual mind then. All right. Two left. Daiki pushed on. He'd dwell more on those thoughts later. Can you access the sealed equipment? When one created a clone, any equipment they had on them was generally cloned as well. Since the seal was tattooed directly into his skin, it made him wonder if there was a puff of smoke that emanated from his clone's hand, and within it, grasped in his palm, was the white hilt of a familiar Kumomake ninjato. 
The weapon of that missing mean he killed nearly a month ago. What was his name again? Kajiro or something? It was kind of surreal how easily he could forget the name of a man he murdered, decapitated and then handed over his head for cash. Well, guess that answers that then. Daiki blinked. That would be incredibly useful in the future. Only one left then. His clone agreed, before erupting into smoke as he dispelled himself. As soon as the clone was gone, a rush of memories swept through Daiki's head, all from the perspective of his clone. He could see in his mind's eyes the status screen from another perspective the have chakra capacity, the feel of the ninjato in his palm. It was actually a bit disorienting. I shouldn't abuse this too much right now and recycle the clones every hour or so at most. He mused. He had to remember he didn't have an innate Jinchuriki slash Uzumaki combo healing factor, or anything even close to that. Yet, I can work with that. He grinned, bringing his fingers into the cross-shaped hand seal once again and shouting, Shadow Clone Jutsu! Time to get down to the grind, right and proper, time to crinkle those leaves. Daiki sighed, the sizzling of cooking meat sounding in his ears, as he leaned back against the comfortable seating behind him. It was soft and comfortable, a balm for his aching muscles. For the most part, after training, he could heal his muscles right up to tip, top shape, more or less, gaining instant muscle increases. His muscles still felt the fatigue though, and through constant punishment, Phantom rips in in the muscles themselves. He had to admit, the seating inside the booths of Yakiniku Q felt absolutely heavenly compared to his piece of crap couch. I should look into getting enough cash to move to a better place or at least get better furniture. He mused to himself that would involve going on more missions to raise the money though. And, well, he was kind of, you know, super busy training himself into the dirt so he didn't become a statistic when Orochimaru decided he wanted to invade because he was still baby raging over the fact Minato got picked over him to be Hokage. Oh well, it was kind of working for him if his status screen was anything to go by. Name? Daiki Yurii. Age? 13. Chakra Capacity? 18. 900 slash 18. 900. Chunin. Strength. 69 slash 500. Endurance. 102 to 500. Durability. 69 slash 500. Agility. 69 out of 500. Taijutsu. 145 slash 500. Ninjutsu. 165 slash 500. Jinjutsu. 10 out of 500. Bukijutsu. 40 out of 500. Chakra control. 180 slash 500. Chakra affinities. Lightning. Adept you have stepped onto the path of roaring thunder. Fuinjutsu. Adept you are no longer a mere amateur. He was looking damn fine now. Everything seemed to just balloon upwards now that he had clones he could spar with, especially his Bukijutsu and Taijutsu. Since he could use multiple styles to fight and so could his clones, they could mitch and batch, get experience fighting in all different ways. Funny though, that his ninjutsu had blown right past his taijutsu, after he'd managed to finally crinkle the crap out of that damn leaf. Honestly, after that, getting the fireball jutsu down had been easy street. In total he'd worked on his lightning chakra for a month, two, or more even technically when including clones into his training, which made his chakra capacity grow massively in the process as well. He mentally thanked Kakashi for this training method. God, it was helpful. Hmm, actually, could I send a clone off to do deranks for me every single day? He wondered. That shouldn't be too much of a problem. And he could accumulate missions for his record and earn money every day while he was at it. As it was, he'd learned pretty much everything he had access to right now beyond the Raisingan, but he wasn't sure he wanted to touch that for the time being. Maybe it would be best to give a little time on it to make it seem more natural. If he just barraged Haruzen and such with the news of all this crap he was coming across or recreating, it would look too good to be true, and definitely seem suspicious, even though no spy would ever be so blatant as to wave that crap in front of people's faces. It would just lead to awkward questions he didn't want to answer though. Though he definitely needed to work on that Jinjutsu score, somehow. Maybe go see Iraka Sensei? He knew he had learned a few Jinjutsu, the man had used them to test his class now and then after all and one of the tests to obtain his headband had been breaking out of Irika's hell viewing technique. The grind never ends. Daiki chuckled under his breath, putting it out of mind as he grabbed the tongs that had been provided to him and flipped over the meat atop the barbecue within his booth. While he waited, 
he flared chakra through his palm, and in a buff of smoke, a map appeared in front of him. He repeated the motion, and a pencil appeared as well. God, his Dimension 4 seal was so freaking convenient, no having to reach for scrolls or anything like that. Just a thought and he was holding what he wanted. Truly the best jutsu ever. What is with that place, honestly? He rolled his eyes as he focused on a specific part of the map. He'd been taking the time to triangulate where Isabu, the three-tailed bijou, should be right now. And he was pretty sure he knew where it was. The huge lake Isabu was in was between Fire Country and Tea Country for sure, since Kabuto took a boat to reach the area. Which wouldn't make sense for anywhere else, especially because Tea Country was to the south of Fire Country, and lead out into the open ocean according to the map. The problem was, there were no large water surfaces between Fire Country and Tea Country. But, if one took a boat across the Hanyuri Gulf, part of the ocean that swept into a junction in between Wind Country, Fire Country and Tea Country, they would find themselves in the Land of Rivers. A small country named as such because of the massive, massive lake or river that used to be connected to the ocean before a fight Hashirama Senju was a part of rearranged the map and created a landmass that cut it off. A place that was less than 20 miles away from where he met Shiromori, and not even a day's journey from the Katabami gold mine, where Raiga Kurosaki was. River country sure is rife with treasure. Daiki snorted to himself. But yes, he was sure that was where Isabu was. Now he only needed to get stronger, copy and learn how Naruto's seal worked, or at least half of it and somehow convince the three-tailed bijou to willingly join up with him and let him become its Jinchuriki. Then somehow explain that off without it sounding like complete bullcrap to everyone around him. Maybe he could spin a tale involving Raiga and Ranmaru, take care of three daimyo with one shuriken and all that. Before he could think any further on it, a loud voice broke him from his thoughts. Meet his youth! Daiki blinked slowly. Indeed, one must partake in plenty of meat and facilitate their protein intake. A younger male voice agreed. Meat is indeed youthful. Can't you guys be quiet for one day? A soft female voice groused in annoyance. The patron already told us. There's no booths left. Let's just go somewhere else. You're disturbing the other customers. Nonsense 1010. The first voice harumphed. I'm sure some will be amendable to sharing space with us. And as the voice finished, a head full of shiny black, bowl-cut-shaped hair peeked over the barrier hiding the booth Daiki was in, and a blinding grin shone towards him. Why hello there my young youthful friend! Mado Guy greeted him boisterously. I see that you are alone in this booth. Might it perhaps be okay for I and my youthful students to join you and partake in youthful tasty meal together? Ah! Daiki blinked slowly before shrugging. Sure! I don't see why not. I've got plenty of space. He gestured to the other side of the booth, enough for four people to sit comfortably with nary a soul. He wasn't going to say no to the chance to get to know them. How youthful. Guy flashed him a thumbs up, before turning and saying something to his team and gesturing to them to follow him. A moment later, he bore witness to a robust, muscular and tall bow-haired man in a green leotard, followed by his mini-me, and a long hair, white-eyed pretty boy sitting opposite him while the seating at his side shifted as the last member of their name sat next to him. Sorry about them. Ten Ten apologized with a sheepish smile, cheeks flushed and rubbing the nape of her neck in embarrassment. Don't worry about it, he waved her apology off. I had plenty of space as you can see. Looking at her, he had to admit, Ten Ten was quite the looker. A pretty creamy skinned face, warm chocolate brown eyes, a cute delicate looking nose, a graceful neck, and a quick glance from the corner of his eyes, seeing the way the front of her sleeveless pink shirt stretched out at the front, told him that she was far more curvaceous than Sakura. He was actually surprised. He thought Ten Ten was more the slender type, but she was actually kind of stacked. A pleasure to meet you, friend. Guy's mini-me thrust out a thumbs up at him, drawing him from saying anything else to the pretty bun-haired girl at his side. I am Kanoha's beautiful green beast, Rock Lee. He flashed a massive grin at him, and for a moment, Daiki was sure he heard an audible ping come from them. Daiki? He introduced himself rather blankly. Seeing it on a screen was one thing, but it in no way prepared him for the sheer exuberance of the older boy. That's the way Lee. Socializing is youth. Guy cheered, before flashing a thumbs up at Daiki just like his student. 
and I am Kanoha's sublime green beast, Mado Guy. Daiki blinked at him, before looking at the long-haired Niji who seemed to be doing his very best to ignore his teammate's very existence. Are you also some kind of beast of Kanoha? The look Niji gave him in return. One would think he'd insulted his dead parents, ancestry, and everything else he took pride in. No, th no, I am not. He replied simply, before grunting out his name and looking away to stare out of the window and probably imagine the other occupants of the booth out of existence. A groan of dismay came from Ten Ten. This is why no other teams want to hang out with us anymore? She whined. She shook her head and forced a brittle smile on her face. I'm Ten Ten. She introduced herself. You have it rough, huh? Daiki pointed out. Kinda glad I don't have teammates now. Well, there was no now about it. He'd been thanking his lucky stars since he talked to Sasuke about it. You have no idea. Ten Ten groaned. He resisted the urge to pat her on the back sympathetically. A part of the Genin Corps, I assume, then youthful Daiki? Guy hummed, making him look over to the man. How is it treating you? You look like a strong lad. I can't imagine you not doing well. Pretty well. There's a lot more freedom in it I've figured out recently than having a Jonin sensei. He shrugged. I don't really have anyone to teach me. But hard work and guts are carrying me along pretty well regardless. Silence. The whole booth went silent for a good five seconds and Daiki felt himself get a bit uncomfortable as Guy. And Lee just kind of stared at him. And then they exploded. Oh my goodness. Guy wept. Great big tears. Daiki Kuen, you are so youthful. Lee joined him. And then they began hugging each other and crying together. He turned to Ten Ten. Correction. You have it really rough. Ten Ten whimpered. Thankfully, after that, Guy and Lee seemed to quiet down. And while Guy ordered food for his team, discussion naturally shifted to the big shiny red coinkadink. Or rather coincidence they all had in common. Being ninja. Lee asked what sort of shinobi he was, and at first Daiki wasn't really sure how to answer, before settling on claiming to be a general shinobi, with leanings towards ninjutsu and taijutsu. He got especially hyped about the taijutsu and invited Daiki to come meet him at training ground 9 anytime and they could spar. Guy jumped in and happily agreed to even give Daiki some tips if he did. It was definitely something to keep in mind. Ten Ten asked him what kind of jutsu he knew, and he rattled of a few, mentioning the mystical palm though, had her giving him an odd look before changing the subject to ask about missions. Really, they had a lot of interesting missions to talk about, even completing a B-rank mission together at one point apparently. The most he had to share really was his last mission. It did seem to get a bit of attention from Niji though when he revealed he'd killed and claimed the bounty of a Kumo Ninja, even got a slight nod of respect out of the frigid Hugo prodigy. Time seemed to fly in and before he knew it, he had eaten his food, ordered more and finished that up and Team 9 were right there with him. He actually didn't even need to pay. Guy happily footed the bill for being kind enough to let them join him in his booth, before rushing off with Lee, both running on their hands through the streets of Kanoha. Niji said nothing as he left, leaving him alone with Ten Ten. Please don't tell me you're actually going to wear that? Ten Ten grimaced beside him, pointing at the gift guy had left him with the profound tip of, stay youthful, a green leotard that he held in his hand. What? Don't think I could pull it off. He grinned at her. I don't even Tsunade-sama could pull that off. Ten Ten gagged. Oh, he begged to differ, especially with how skin tight it was. Think so? Daiki raised an eyebrow at her. I think you could pull it pretty well, actually. After all, now that they were out of the booth, he could get a good look at her, good and proper-like, and he had to admit he was not wrong. Ten Ten was pretty tall for a girl, with long, tonged legs, and green baggy pants she wore, were stretched out deliciously at the back. Ten Ten had it going on for sure. Her cheeks flushed a little bit. Stop! She giggled a bit, punching him lightly on the arm. Seems she wasn't all that used to boys flirting with her. Kind of expected with how much time she spent training and being a tomboy, but still good to know. All right, all right. He held up his hands in surrender. So, what's up? Daiki asked, getting to the root of the issue. There had to have been a reason she hung around instead of leaving with her teammates right? She winced. I don't really like asking this, but I've hit a brick wall. The pretty older girl began. Can you help me with the mystical palm jutsu? Oh, that was all? Sure. Daiki agreed. Not only would it get him in good with not only a fellow Kanoha ninja, 
and a pretty older female one at that. But Guy was nice enough to offer him some tips and to come to him for advice if he needed it even. So, he saw no reason why he shouldn't help his student out in turn. Plus, beyond all that, he kind of liked Ten Ten. He'd come to see she had quite the sarcastic personality and dry personality to her. That was easy. Ten Ten froze, surprised. Should it have been though? We hit it off with pretty well, right? He pointed out. Anyway, you can generally find me in Training Ground 69 when I'm not busy with missions or the like. Oh, okay dash. Ten Ten began responding before freezing and giving him a deadpan look. Why do I feel like you chose that specific number of training ground just for the number alone? His lips twitched into a switch. Because you've got brains to go with that beauty? He winked. Her face flushed a deep red. And he laughed, bidding her goodbye and continuing on. He had more training to do after all. The grind never ended. Are you sure this is a good idea? Kakashi looked up from his book to meet the Sandame Hokage's eyes. I mean, Sasuke is fine, but Sakura has no filter when she's around him and Naruto's still far too rash. They aren't really a team that's suited for escorting a high-class VIP. It's a B-rank in name only, Hiruzen puffed on his pipe. It's only that high even because of who you're escorting. The chance of combat is drastically low, and it's less than a day's travel from here and it will look good for your team's mission record when the chance comes to be promoted. It's rather silly so, is it not? Kakashi directed his phase to the mission scroll sitting on the Hokage's deck, displaying the picture of the client. Who ever heard of the leader of a hidden village having to pay another village to escort them? Waterfall sadly has precious few shinobi these days, and young Shibuki lacks the disposition needed. The Hokage shook his head. Quite a waste really, the boy is incredibly talented. Perhaps he could even have been a match for you given a few years if not for being afraid of his shadow. Perhaps, Kakashi shrugged lightly. Though, I have a feeling there's a specific shinobi, or rather Kunoichi you want me to check in on while I'm there. He eyed the older man knowingly. Well, I wouldn't pick your team for this mission otherwise. The genin act as a good smokescreen for you to sneak in. Hiruzen chortled lightly. He was just making sure young ninja got some props for their part in it. He reached into his robe and pulled out a scroll, unrolling it across his desk. Her name is Fu, no last name, an orphan from what we have been able to uncover. She is 16 years old, general strength below that of your typical Chunin. Waterfall has few capable of teaching her. After all, she is the current container of the Nanabai, the seven-tailed horn beetle. Depicted on the scroll was a young teenage girl. She had tan skin with short mint green hair and striking bright orange eyes. And you just want me to check on her? Kakashi asked. That's all. Just get me a general personality profile and check how she's treated by her village. Haruzen confirmed with a nod. Waterfall is not known for their ceiling prowess. We have to know if she is liable to lose control and unleash the beast. While not as powerful as the QB, not even close, it is still the third most powerful of the tailed beasts. And with the ability to fly freely through the air, it is a terrible foe to deal with and could devastate the countryside before we can stop it. Kakashi grimaced. Yes, he could understand exactly how big a threat that would be. All right, I'll get it done. The copy ninja promised. Splendid. Haruzen grinned, before pausing for a moment. Actually, a young genin has caught my eye lately. Part of the genin core. He's training very hard to make up for that. Would you be fine taking him along? A B rank on his record will go a long way to allowing him to compete in the Chunin exams. From the genin core, huh? Kakashi hummed with interest. The next morning, Daiki made his way to his ever homey training ground a bit earlier than usual. The sun even had only shown the barest hints of beginning to rise and that was only because it was summer. Not that it would be like that much longer, they were already at the tail end of summer, mind you. Still, there was a whistle on his lips and spring in his step as he jauntily swaggered his way through the paths between the training grounds towards his destination. He was in a good mood, for sure. And why wouldn't he be? His abilities were looking sweet as crap. He had an Uchiha who plopped his ass in his training ground occasionally to challenge him to spars and even now would have a cute older girl coming to him for assistance and letting him endear himself to her. And on top of all that, he had a rough plan of action for the future. Really, everything was coming up Daiki. This was the age of the great Daiki. Abruptly, 
The great Daiki paused just outside of training ground seven and stared. A somewhat short girl, just around five feet tall, stood hiding behind a tree. Short, midnight blue hair, and porcelain skin, dressed in a large, baggy white jacket and a pair of dark blue shinobi pants. Hinata Hugo was peering around a tree, stealthily, bending out just a bit to look into the training ground. Well, at the very least, he could see for himself that like the tree she was hiding behind with her bent over like that, he could see Hinata had quite the trunk of her own. Why the hell doesn't she just use her Byakugan? He couldn't help but wonder. This was precious time in which she could be training. She could at least be training her Dejitsu and expending Chakra constantly to increase her capacity if she was going to waste time spying on Naruto. Truly a plebeian to the great grind set. Honestly, watching her waste her time like that made his skin crawl a bit. She was a damn Kunoichi for crying out loud. How long had she even been there? He couldn't believe how wasteful that was. Why come to the training grounds this early just to spy on a crush, yet never even approach them? If she was at least using her Byakugan to do it, he could let it slide because at least some gains would be getting made. Hinata was almost as much of a disappointment in the ninja arts as Sakura and Ino, only wasn't, because she had superior training than them from her clan. But considering Hinata was the oldest of his graduating class, well, the disappointment only grew. Come to think of it, besides Daiki himself, Naruto was the youngest of their graduating class. Did that make Hinata an Erera type? Eh, probably not, she had the body for it and the background, but she lacked the mindset. Silly Hinata, if she worked up the nerve and Erera Naruto, he would have been eating out of the palm of her hand. Speaking of Naruto, Daiki was curious as to what kind of grind the boy was up to. He made his way over to Hinata, light on his feet and she didn't even notice him coming. Truly, she wasted her jujitsu. He stopped behind her and peeked over her head into the training ground. Yep, there was Naruto. He had divested his usual orange jacket, leaving him in just his orange pants, sandals, and mesh shirt, and was currently in the process of push-ups. His face caked in sweat, and a small puddle having formed beneath him. And off to the side, he could see all three of the training posts typical of one of the Kanoha training grounds. Daiki nodded in approval. It was suboptimal of a grind, but he was grinding away for sure. And he supposed with his innate healing factor, being an Uzumaki and Jinchiriki, he was gaining mightily regardless of how poorly his grind was. So, stalking Naruto again, Hinata? Daiki pulled his head back around the tree and asked from behind her. Hinata gave a small startled eep, and whirled around, face flushing a bright red, D Daiki San, she stuttered. I am indeed Daiki, he agreed with a nod. Why not go just talk to him instead of wasting time like this? He got straight to the point of the issue. Hinata just stared at him for a moment before swallowing heavily. I, I can't. You're never gonna get him if you act like this. He couldn't help but roll his eyes. Naruto ended up with plenty of girls after him, even what amounted to the leader of an entire country wanting him to impregnate her. Nice going, Naruto. He couldn't help but mentally praise the future Naruto. The current Naruto was thoughtless and ignorant, but he'd grow into himself well for sure. What do you mean? Hinata asked shyly, poking her fingers together. You know what I mean, let's not jump around the issue, he rolled his eyes. And as you are right now, you aren't right for him either. What she wanted wasn't a role she could fulfill. She didn't have the strength or mental fortitude to be a partner for Naruto and support him. Freaking hell she couldn't approach him for a conversation. A hurt expression flashed on her face. Ah, I see. Hinata looked down. Ah, his chest stung at the expression and how defeated she looked. And he realized what situation he was in right now. He just kind of approached a lone girl who was watching over the target of her affections and started lambasting her, now he just felt bad, since she really was just a genuinely nice girl. Thankfully, he could fix that. Hinata yelped as he wrapped an arm around her waist and heaved her up into the air and over his shoulder. Despite that dump truck she had on her, she was light as a feather, and with her pressed up against him like this, he could get a feel for her chest. She was just as stacked as Tenten, maybe a bit more actually. She would come across as even more voluptuous, he supposed, since she was that much shorter than Tenten. 
W what are you doing Daiki-san? Hinata spluttered. Turning on his heel, Daiki resumed his trek towards the ever-welcoming training ground 69. I felt bad with how sad you looked, he shrugged. So, I'll help you out. You want to be closer to Naruto, right? I can make that happen. Why you can? Any hesitancy in her left and she gaped at him, white eyes wide. But he heard the hopefulness in her voice. She swallowed quickly and shook her head. You, you don't need to do that. He ignored what she said. What time do you usually meet your team? He asked instead. Nine. Hinata replied. Plenty enough time, it was only just after five in the morning right now. Good enough. He nodded. Also, don't worry about feeling indebted or something or like I'm going out of my way. I'll be getting something out of this as well. You will. Hinata blinked. Damn right he would. There were two things he needed to do with her to help her achieve Femme Fatale Era Era status. One, get her confident in her body and rid her of the shyness, something he already had an idea for. Secondly, was making Hinata get good. In the process, he would be able to spar against the gentle fist of the Hyuga clan, which would give him experience in the future with it, should he end up fighting Niji in the Chunin exams. And again, the more experience he got fighting with the more variety of opponents, the more his skill stats tended to rise. So, he'd get gains and he would get free eye candy out of it, a win-win for him really. Two of her fingers lashed out, aiming for his shoulder, but were easily avoided. He stepped into her guard and Hinata's eyes widened as his knee flashed up. She tried to jump back, but he was too fast for her to retreat from, and could only bring one of her arms up to block it feebly. Her arm bone rattled from the force and Hinata grimaced as she was sent flying back through the air. She slammed into the ground hard on her back and lay there for a moment, panting deeply and staring up at the sun that had properly risen now. He was so strong. Daiki-san is absolutely ruthless. She thought idly. Was he different back in the academy? She remembered he kept to himself mostly, but he fought tooth and nail during spars, though she couldn't remember him having the same edge to him. It wasn't really a bother. Her father was rougher on her when he forced her to spar with him anyway. What am I even doing here? Hinata wondered. It had all happened so fast. Daiki had found her watching over Naruto Kuen. He caught on to her feelings. Easily, as if they were as plain as day, hammered in that she wasn't good enough for Naruto Kuen. A fact she already well knew, and then just dragged her off to train with him. That was three hours ago. For a full two and a half hours, Daiki had ran through physical conditioning, and she'd noticed he was wearing weights of some kind. He'd made her join in as well, but not before making her take off her jacket, leaving her in just her mesh shirt, and forcing her to keep her Byakugan activated constantly. She'd only managed a fraction of the amount of exercises Daiki did, and that was without weights. And then once he was done, he'd forced her to spar with him, and he'd thrown her around like a rag doll. She felt less like a training partner and more like a punching bag really. He reminded her of Sasuke Uchiha with how intense he was during sparring, and a lot of Naruto Kuen with how he threw himself into his training. She couldn't measure up to him at all. She was a failure after all. Still, she just had to keep trying and not give up. She'd get there eventually, even with how untalented she was, right? A shadow was cast over her suddenly, and Daiki's face stared down at her from above. He stared down into her eyes, before his gaze trailed down to her chest. On reflex, Hinata's arms came up to cover her chest, with how much she'd grown recently. Her obscene melons bulged out the front of her mesh armor quite plainly. And with the way they stretched it out, if one looked closely, they would be able to see quite a lot of her chest through the mesh. Is, is this really necessary? Hinata couldn't help but ask, face flushing in embarrassment. She'd asked why he made her take off her jacket before and leaving her in just her mesh armor. But he just told her to do it and not question him, that it was needed. So far, all she knew was that she'd been jumping around a lot with the fat on her chest bouncing around noticeably. If only she were slender like Sakura-san, a proper cute girl, she wouldn't have this issue. The few times she'd seen Sakura-san in mesh armor alone, her chest didn't bulge the mesh out obscenely like her own chest did. Of course it is, Daiki shrugged with a grin. You're way too shy. It's kind of annoying, actually. You need to be more comfortable in your body, so the best way is to show it off a bit, and sparring at the same time makes sure you're growing stronger while you do respect the grind Hinata.
He lifted his hand and waggled his finger at her as if giving her a stern lecture. Well, it kind of made sense, she supposed. She admitted, if only to herself. She'd forgot her state of dress when the sparring began and had to put all her thoughts into making sure Daiki didn't smash her into paste. Though, she still didn't understand fully what he meant by the grind. She assumed it had something to do with training, especially because he kept paraphrasing the words gains, which obviously was some form of slang for gaining more strength. Looks like you're done now though, he mused and sat down beside her. Well, three hours of conditioning and sparring isn't bad. I doubt Sakura or Ino could last even a third as long as you, so good on you I suppose. Yet, despite the fact that he was sweating quite noticeably, Daiki looked like he was still raring to go, and that was while wearing those weights of his. Still, a small rush of pride ran through her at his light praise. It may have been petty of her, but she felt good at being praised at being better at something than Sakura-san, the girl who held all of Naruto-kun's attention. Too bad, his plan would never work. He was missing one crucial thing that seemed to fly over his head in regards to her. I understand what you're trying to do. Hinata pushed herself up into a sitting position beside him. But it won't work. Pretty sure it will. He refuted confidently, without hesitation. How she wished she could have that same confidence he seemed to have. She envied that. She giggled lightly. It won't. She still had to insist. Thank you for trying, it does mean a lot. But, you can't be confident in something that has no worth. My body isn't as attractive as Sakura-san's, so there's no way I can compete with her for Naruto Kuin's affection. She had made her peace with that back in the academy. She knew she would never get Naruto Kuin to herself, but she still couldn't resist watching over him training, never giving up and trying to emulate that, he inspired her to keep going. Still, it meant a lot that Daiki was trying to help her regardless. Even though he blatantly pointed out himself how impossible it was for her to achieve what she wanted. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much. And it keeps me going. Plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.